Before I commence, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which the parliament sits. I would also like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to other First Nations people who are present or who are watching. Today's hearing is being conducted as a fully virtual hearing. This enables the work of the community to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. Today we'll be hearing from government departments and agencies, including Infrastructure New South Wales, the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, the New South Wales Environmental Protection Authority and Transport for New South Wales. Before we commence, I would like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the virtual hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it's important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry's terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness could only take uh, could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. Today's proceedings are being recorded and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. The hearing is also being broadcast and saved on the Parliament's YouTube channel. Finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise disruptions and assist our Hansard reporters. Can I ask committee members to clearly identify who questions are directed to? And can I ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking? Could everyone please mute their microphones when they're not speaking? And members and witnesses should avoid speaking over each other so we can all be heard clearly. I now welcome our first witness, uh, Mr. Uh, Simon Draper from Infrastructure New South Wales. First, Mr. Draper, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or an affirmation from the cards that have been emailed to you by the Secretariat. Yes, thanks Chair. It's Simon Draper. I'm the Chief Executive of Infrastructure New South Wales. Um, I solemnly, sincerely and We will just wait for Mr. Draper to think to resolve some connection difficulties that he might be having. So, Draper, are you still present with us? Okay, we'll pause there and we'll uh, invite the Secretariat um, perhaps to resolve with Mr. Draper the connection issues to the best that they can. Really do need elevator music or something during these periods. Mr. Mallard, you are welcome. You're welcome to sing a tune for us if you wish. Oh, you wouldn't wish for that. <laughs> John Graham and I could do a duet. <laughs> I only do percussion. I, I just advise all people who are watching uh, that Mr. Draper is dialing in from a separate connection.
think we might have Mr. Draper with us via phone. Is that you, Mr. Draper? I am, and I'll I'll try. So apologies about that. I'll try and my computer is just completely frozen. Um, I'll try and reconnect with my computer while we're talking. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Draper. We might ask you to restate your name and position and take uh, the oath and affirmation again, if that's possible, please. Okay. Yeah, it's Simon Draper, Chief Executive of Infrastructure New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Draper. Uh, Mr. Draper, would you like to make a short opening statement of no more than three minutes? No, thanks, Chair. That's fine. I'll take questions. Okay, great. We'll, we'll proceed immediately to questioning, um, commencing with the opposition. Um, Mr. Draper, I might just ask, uh, establish the most preliminary of facts. Infrastructure New South Wales is responsible amongst its other functions for <clears throat> reviewing business cases, is it not? That's correct. Chair, that's one of our one of our functions is to um, undertake reviews of business cases as part of our assurance process, and we report uh, we provide reports to government on the um, the status uh, and satisfaction of um, business cases. Yeah, and under that the infrastructure investor assurance framework, which I believe applies to New South Wales government, you have to review both the strategic business case and the final business case. Do you not? That's correct. Can you tell us when uh, the business case for the Western Harbour Tunnel Northern Beaches Link was reviewed by Infrastructure New South Wales, the final business case? Yeah, just uh, give me a moment and I will. Um, so the, they're separate. There's a, there's a business case for um, Western Harbour Tunnel and a business case for um, Beaches Link that has been done separately. I yep. think they were. So are you after the one on Western Harbour Tunnel? Well, why don't we go for both? When was um, the last time each of them was reviewed? Uh, well, the business, ca the business case for Beaches Link is still um, uh, uh, being reviewed. Um, so there's no investment decision on, on Beaches Link as yet. Um, so I'm just looking for my notes for the Western Harbour Tunnel. Uh, it's been through a number of um, iterations. Uh, so there was a, a gate to what we call a gate to review uh, undertaken in uh, November 2017. Um, and then I believe there was a subsequent one done in 2019. It was an update in, um, in 2009, September 2019. So it hasn't effectively, the la has been looked at in the last two years. Is that fair? It was at the end of the end of 2019 was, uh, was when the uh, Gate 2 review was undertaken for um, Western Harbour Tunnel. And just on the Beaches link, uh, can I ask why, uh, when will that review of that business case complete? Um, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's underway. There's been a review um, being undertaken for Beaches link, um, but it's not completed yet. Okay. Can you uh, just turn to the sources of funding for the Western Harbour Tunnel and or Northern Beaches uh, Link project. Are either of them have any reservations or commitments from the Restart New South Wales Fund? There was a initial reservation, I think it was about one, it was over one billion, one point one billion dollars um, for um, Western Harbour Tunnel. Um, and that stands, I think, um, of that um, that was used for a number of motor wage projects, but about 800 and I think 870 million um, of that was for Western Harbour and Tunnel. So there's an $870 million reservation in the restart fund for Western Harbour Tunnel. Is that correct? As of still today? That's, that, that's, the, that's the approved amount for the Western Harbour Tunnel. Yeah. Has there, um, has any funds from the restart New South Wales been released the Western Harbour Tunnel project. Um, look, I couldn't tell you where that's at. Um, what we what the process is that we make recommendations um, that to the treasurer um, on the set, whether the um, uh, the funding meets the criteria of the fund, um, and the funding is then managed through treasury. So we don't directly manage that process. So, right. um, Chair, so I'm just trying to rejoin through my computer too while just while we're talking. I'll do that now. Thank you. That would be appreciated, Mr. Draper. Um, 
as well. Uh, can I ask, infrastructure New South Wales considering re-reviewing the business case for Western Harbour Tunnel, uh, given the COVID developments? Should be back now. Um, no, we're not reviewing the business case uh, for Western Tunnel Tunnel because of um, because of COVID. Uh, is there a reason why not? Um, there'd be more the case of is there a reason to do so? Um, um, th it, has there been such a fundamental change? Well, first of all, we only review business cases when they um, when they get redone by the the, the sponsor agency and minister. So, um, unless unless that's brought to us, we won't. Re there's nothing to review. Um, uh, and I guess there's no real basis that we would um, go to government and say that the business case needs to be reviewed at this stage. I mean, there's a number of things which will emerge over the course of coming um, months um, through the procurement process. There'll be more information coming through about the project, um, but there's no particular reason why this would be reviewed or uh, as a standout to any other uh, project. You're aware that Transport for New South Wales abandoned the development partner model for this project? Um, I know they were exploring it and that they um, uh, examined that as a model um, and that it was decided not to proceed with that approach. Did that cause infrastructure New South Wales to change its risk rating of this project? No, um, no, there was no particular reason why we would um, rate it differently because of the different model. In fact, the delivery partner model was something that we haven't commonly used in the New South Wales government. Um, it's something which uh, is being used on other major projects. I think Western Sydney Airport, the Commonwealth Government's using a similar model, but it's not something we use as a standard in any case. But, well, then what, what is the exact existing risk rating on this project, Western Harbour Tunnel and Northern Beaches Link, for infrastructure New South Wales? I'm not sure what you mean by risk rating. Well, you are uh, required by the Infrastructure Investor Assurance Framework, are you not, to both assess the risk of the project being delivered late and the project being delivered on budget, are you not? That's the, the two of the criteria we use, yes, to rate it, to provide advice to, to to Cabinet. So do you consider this project to be on track in terms of its delivery timetable? Look, um, I'll, I'll speak generally. We'd say generally it's on track, but I do want to be, I have sort of advised the committee, there's a number of things that we, um, information we receive through the assurance process that we can't discuss because it's, we provide advice to cabinet on that so it's cabinet in confidence okay sure um i i will well, well um i'll allow you to whenever you wish to sort of cite that mr draper feel free whether we accept it's a different question but you feel you're entitled to, to, to cite it what about in terms of cost do you maintain the view that the cost is likely to come in in accordance with the 2019 business case um, as far as we're aware, that's the case, but we're going through a procurement process now. Um, uh, well, we are transports going through a procurement process at the moment, and that will reveal a lot more information about the um, likely outturn cost of the project. Um, and as you know, from other hearings we've been in together, Chair, the, um, the view of Infrastructure New South Wales is that those costs become firmer and firmer the more you get down that path. Sure, look, I'm only got a few more questions before I invite my colleagues, but um, to, to ask, but, how is it on the what is your understanding of what procurement model that transport is currently pursuing? Because you've made repeated references to this procurement process. What procurement process are they currently doing? Um, well, there's a couple of different uh, elements to the the project. So we're talking about Western Harbour Tunnel. As you know, um, Warringah Freeway upgrade was originally sort of treated as part of that overall package. That's already been contracted. I think that's a, um, a design and contract or more of an incentivised target cost approach, which I think is very sensible. And I think that was the outcome of engagement with the market about the, the types of risks involved and the form of procurement that would allow a number of um, participants uh, to involve themselves in that project. Um, the Western Harbour Tunnel, the main uh, project there, there's a couple of different elements. There's an asset manager role uh, that's going through procurement. Um, and that's sort of a, an operations and maintenance, ongoing operation and maintenance role into the future and provides advice as the project's being built. Um, there, and then there's, I think, two packages, um, tunnel packages and, and um, the other associated works, the mechanical and electrical works that go with that, that'll go to the market. And I think one of those is in the, currently in the e expression of interest stage. So uh, 
was it, were these contracts considered as part of your business case review or not? Um, during the business, would have assessed that on according. I mean, sorry, let me just rephrase the question, Mr. Draper. Did you assess the 2019 business case according to the development partner procurement model or the current procurement model? The development partner model was um, considered almost separately. So we we, we evaluated that um, uh, because they weren't going through a process of evaluating that process. It was never a it was never a um, if you like a fundamental element of the project. It was an option that was considered. Um, it was examined by the agencies. We did do reviews on um, that process, um, and we concurred with the decision of the um, uh, of transport not to proceed with that approach. And did that give you a reason why they weren't proceeding with that approach? Uh, look, usually they, what well, I mean, the, 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 I'll speak generally um, uh, because we are getting into that sort of area that I described earlier that's sort of cabinet in confidence for us. But just generally, what the process we'd go through is to compare a process like that with what you would call a sort of a, um, a comparator uh, where you'd public use a more standard comparator process. Or which form of yeah, comparator? Well, yeah, a public sector comparator is something more when you are um, provide, yeah. uh, providing the private sector an opportunity to get to take on the complete project. This is more just a comparator with what I'd call a, a more standard procurement model, which is more that the agency itself is undertaking the role of the client more comprehensively. Okay, but I'll just pass to my colleagues in a second, um, but basically, is it the case that transport abandoned that model because it would have been too expensive to proceed with a development partner and it was cheaper to continue on with either the, the, the public sector procuring it itself? Yeah, I think that was, I think that's a core element of that the process is that um, it's better value, or what the, it's a value for money question, that's correct. Mr. Graham or Ms. Moriarty in a very limited time. Uh, Mr. Draper, I might just ask you, in relation to the beaches link part of the proposals that we're looking at uh, any uh, perspective you got you've got on infrastructure australia's view of this project in their most recent infrastructure priority list that's the current infrastructure priority list in september 21 uh, september this year the beaches link has now disappeared altogether uh, it previously had been on the list it was on the long list of five to ten years it's now gone altogether can you give us any perspective on why Infrastructure Australia doesn't regard this Beaches Link part of the project as a priority? Uh, thanks, Mr. Graham. Look, I don't know that that's actually the case. Um, I haven't discussed that with Infrastructure Australia um, since that time. Uh, I must admit, during that period you're describing, um, we've been pretty preoccupied with just um, getting the industry back up and running. But so, no, I don't have an answer to that. I don't. I don't know that they. Do have that reflection, or they do have that view, um, but I accept your um, account of the the facts in the in the report. Um, but I don't have any ref any comment on on why they've uh, they've taken that approach. And finally, I might just ask: uh, you've talked about the um, business cases you reviewed. Uh, you also would have reviewed the previous business case when the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link were considered together. Did you review the project definition and delivery report uh, that was then produced in order to deal with some of the constraints of that early business case? Yeah, I think that's the, the uh, project definition and delivery report. Um, that was the one that I think we evaluated. That was sort of an outcome of the after the first business case evaluation. Correct. That was the one that we did in late 2019, I believe. Thank you. That was that was for that was for Western Harbour Tunnel rather than the um, combined package, I believe. Uh, we'll go to the cross bench and look. We are running. We might just because of the technical difficulties, we might run a couple of minutes over, Mr. Draper. If you have any objections, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's yeah. fine. Sorry, Miss Boyd. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you very much, Mr. Draper, for making yourself available this afternoon. Um, I just want to come back to the um, impacts of COVID uh, and the, the fact that the business case hasn't been reviewed since 2019. If you were asked to review, um, to, to do an update um, reviewing that business case today, would you expect the assessment to be very different? I don't have any reason to believe that's the case, Ms. Boyd. Um, uh, like I guess there's two there's two things you'd be looking at. One would be um, whether we know more about the costs of the project, and we don't yet because it's about to go through procurement now. So once we go through that process, we'd have uh, more up to date 
um, a sense of the cost of the project. Um, and I, I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at, but many people ask about is that of the demand, uh, what level of demand for the project. Um, and that's sort of been a general discussion in the infrastructure sector. I guess our view on that is that it's very easy to um, overweight the current circumstances. So when you're in the midst of a, something like a pandemic, and there's been a, a major decline in a demand for public transport, for motorways and all of those um, transport assets that we have, it's hard to see the future where they might just bounce back, but actually that's, that's a very likely scenario. Um, the other thing I'll say about these projects is they are very long in the delivery phase and also very long in life. So you've got to take a very, very long-term view of the, of the assets um, rather than be too overly influenced by the current circumstances. Um, recently, the Productivity Commission released a report um, entitled Working From Home, which modelled the changes um, that have been brought about by COVID, where um, a number of people have shifted the way they work, but they were also moving further out of the city. Don't you think that would impact on the business case for this project? Well, again, I mean, the the product. I think the, what the Productivity Commission might be referring to um, is what we'd sort of call general long-term trends and in, in changes of patterns of people's movement. In the case of something like the Western Harbour Tunnel, it's this is not a this is not a um, an asset which is, I would say, heavily reliant on people travelling into CBDs to go to offices, which is sort of where the focus, uh, some of that focus is. Um, th this is a this is an asset which is part of a motorway network involving moving not just people but goods uh, and materials around the state and around the city. So I, I, I don't think that the impact would be that great. Um, uh, but look, we'd always be open to examining it if that can, if if there was an opportunity to do so. I'm just giving you my sort of um, preliminary view that um, we haven't seen a lot of evidence so far that this will be a long-term impact that would undermine the viability of a lot of these assets. So in that case, how much of the business case is reliant on there being an increase in the amount of freight that goes through um, on this project? Look, that would be, there, there would be underlying um, uh, demand drivers and forecasts sitting behind the business case. Um, we do, gen with the, but, but I don't think the business case itself would have developed its own assumptions around that. They would have just been taking um, broader um, uh, demand, uh, assumptions from demand drivers that we produce. Like, for example, we produce central population forecasts for the state through the Department of Planning, um, and a lot of the forecasts for freight and other things are driven off that. So they would have just relied on those base assumptions, I think. Um, you state in your review that the project um, will improve the beeline services uh, between Sydney, CBD, North Shore and Northern Beaches and accommodate a new express bus service route um, or routes. Is that the case? Um, is there a guaranteed bus lane um, being proposed for this project? That's a level of detail I don't know. Um... Uh, I'm sure that the transport people who are appearing for you could, could clarify that for you. Um, I think the thinking, the, the point that behind that was to say that um, motorways are not only for private vehicles, but also very useful for high volume public transport as well that's on road public transport. In assessing the business case, did you assume that there would be a dedicated bus lane in through the tunnels? Um, I. Look, I think we would have just assessed the assumptions that were in there. Um, uh, well, we definitely did that, but um, I don't know whether that was a, a, a standout assumption in the business case. Again, I think probably the, the transport officials who are appearing could um, let you know where they stand on that. But from your perspective, presumably a dedicated bus lane would take away from the sort of toll revenue um, that the road would otherwise provide. Yeah, look, that, that's a level of detail. I mean, there's a, there are assumptions at, at a business case stage. There are assumptions about tolling, about traffic. Um, they're fairly. Um, I wouldn't. They're not high level in the sense that they're un, unreliable, but they're not as detailed as they be once once you get into a detailed design process. Um, I don't think that that would fundamentally change the um, robustness of the business case. The um... 
um, benefit cost ratio was pretty marginal, wasn't it? I'm just trying to find it. Was it 1.1, 1 1.2? 1 I think it's I think it's 1.2 to 1.3, yeah. Um, so we are talking about sort of a fine calculation here. Um, so we've sort of touched on the benefits um, and the potential assessment of the benefits there. But what about the, I don't know if you've been tuning into our previous hearings, but there was been a lot of talk about just how little we know about um, the impacts on the environment, um, the um, the costs of, of remediating contamination in the harbour and so on. Um, and given how little we know about the true costs, um, how much of that was taken into account and what, um, I guess, what sort of leeway did you give to that um, when you were reviewing the business case? So what our reviewers would do, um, and just explaining that process that uh, the chair referred to earlier, we, when we undertake these reviews, we um, appoint um, re independent reviewers who, who do that work. We don't do that through our staff uh, ourselves. They're experienced industry people. What they would normally be looking for would be to see whether the agency had made a sufficient provision for the, for the level of um, detail the design was at and, and technical investigation, whether the agency had made a sufficient provision for factors like you just described, the con uh, contamination and other things that are going to draw on contingency. So that's the fact that they um, uh, the business case was supported um, uh, suggests that they had um, made sufficient provision for those things. Um, given... <laughs> I guess, given the um, potential underestimating of the costs and the uh, potential for uh, COVID, for a bunch of other things um, to have impacted on the extent of the benefits, do you think that if you were to do a new review now, that that, that margin would come down in terms of the um, benefit cost ratio? Would that be reasonable to assume? Look, there's there'll be a lot of variables you've picked too. Um, if the costs were higher and one part of the benefits were lower, but if we did it again, you might find other that identified other benefits. It, look, they do move around. They are estimates, um, and they do get updated. Even the costs get updated as you go through. There was another um, calculation of the uh, benefit cost ratio, which included um, uh, wider economic benefits and what they call flow breakdown. Um, so there's some things which we always take the more conservative measure of the BCR, but I think if you take those ones into account, there's also other benefits which we didn't take into account. So, you know, it's it swings and roundabouts. Um, what alternatives were considered in this project? So your review states that, um, that the design of this project um, resulted from extensive consultation and um, evaluation of the options. What were those options? I think there's there were sort of options at two levels as I uh, understand it. One was sort of at the conceptual level. So, you know, you always start with if you don't do the project, that's one option. Um, if you um, were to undertake other approaches like um, uh, augmenting existing motorway assets, um, expanding public transport, which we are doing in any case, as you know, with the um, with the metro. Um, if we were to um, uh, yeah, they're, they're the sorts of options that were examined as part of this process. Um, and then at a sort of a technical level, there were options examined around the design, around the technical approach to building the tunnel, about where the um, the connections to the rest of the network would occur. That, there was those two levels of options analysis undertaken. So was there a solid public transport alternative that was considered as one of those options? Well, I mean, as I said, there's already a, an ex a major public transport investment happening across the across the harbour. So the um, Sydney Metro City and South West, which is in full um, delivery at the moment. Um, so th this was assessed. Uh, they, they, both those investments were actually announced around the same time, so they were complementary. But a metro line to the beaches was that considered as an alternative? Um, no, I think the main the main the main um, uh, existing commitment that would have been taken into account there was the bus rapid transit to the breaches. And that's why there was a reference to public transport through the through the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think just in my last, I'm just looking at the chair, I've got one last question. Um, in relation to um, the impacts of um, emissions and, and the climate impacts, um, when you did your review, did you explicitly consider the New South Wales government's net zero plan? 
um, and the Greater Sydney Commission Sustainability Goals? I don't know the answer to that. Um, we, well, we, when, when you say well, did we consider it, we were assessing the sort of um, robustness of the business case, whether it was done thoroughly and amid the standards of the government, whether the agency considered those things. They certainly would have considered it as part of their um, EIS process, as part of the planning process. So I, I think that would have been thoroughly examined, but I'm not, I, I don't say that Infrastructure New South Wales on, in its own right examine those factors. One final question. Um, whose idea was the Western Harbour Tunnel Beaches Link project? Where did it first come from? I'm told that in the 1960s it was floating around, but this current iteration yeah. of it, where did it come from? I understand, yeah, you're right. All these things, they have these histories that um, they kick around for a long time and transport planners are there. They don't, but they're not, we, they're not visible to all of us. But um, I think the first sort of modern um, version of it was probably in the long-term transport master plan in about uh, 10 years ago. Um, it emerged, it, it certainly um, was in referred to in the Infrastructure New South Wales first state infrastructure strategy. And so there's a reference to this in that inf infrastructure strategy in 2012. And then I think it was announced in um, 2014, it was part of the 2014 state infrastructure strategy. But before things get into state infrastructure strategies, usually the um, responsible agency has been working on options and, pos and possible projects for, for many years prior to that. So you don't know where it originally came from? It, would, it originally came from transport, but it, but it would have been through the various plans that transport's developed over the years. I think the most modern version of that was the long-term transport master plan. Thank you. We'll move to the government now. And I think Mr. Mallard, by enthusiasm, shall get the first call. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Draper, uh, uh, for coming away from your very important and busy job to uh, attend this uh, inquiry. Um, I thought we might start with a history lesson uh, for the benefit of the report. So Infrastructure New South Wales, uh, when was that created? Uh, 2011, there's legislation enacted. Indeed. Uh, did such a body exist under the previous Labor government? Not that I'm aware of, no. Mm. Uh, your role, which has been used to uh, uh, as a weapon against uh, this, this pro the project today by members of the inquiry, uh, is to provide um, assess business cases, provide confidential reports to cabinet, go through gateway processes, to do the infrastructure investor assurance framework, uh, those type of things to give government and the cabinet assurance about the sturdiness, the robustness of the project that we're undertaking. Yeah, that's to give um, to give the government, as you, the very word itself, assurance, investor assurance um, over the the quality of the work that's been done to prepare and some of the risks that might emerge. And as I said earlier, it's sort of not just the staff uh, and executives at Infrastructure New South Wales, but we engage people from. Uh, with a long history in industry um, to do reviews, um, people with subject matter expertise in particular areas, engineers, people who've been involved in delivery or operating of those type of assets. That's correct. You, 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 you over, over, had oversight over some pretty tricky financial and construction projects like the uh, uh, West Connects. Yep, West Connects, the Metro says we've got some very large mega projects in New South Wales and all the ranging all the way down, I don't diminish the importance of um, some of the smaller projects, you know, the school projects and the community facilities and those things as well. They're, they're all there and they're all captured in that assurance process. They're tiered at different levels, but obviously the large projects are, um, are generally, um, well, they're more demanding on the public purse and they're riskier and uh, trickier to deliver. That's correct. So with that vast experience of delivering unprecedented uh, infrastructure in the history of this state ever, uh, you, uh, your organisation is confident that these two projects, if we call it one project, the, the tunnel, Harbour Tunnel and the Northern Beaches uh, Tunnel, are on track heading in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, the, the Western Harbour Tunnel um, is at a point where it's going to market, and I think that's a really critical point. It takes a long time to get to that point. Um, there's a lot of community engagement to, um, to get to get to that stage, the planning consent process, the market engagement. So we're at a really important um, stage. And the fact that it was, I think, announced in 2014, it's now 2021 and we're going to the market, just gives you a sense of how complex that can be. And Beaches Link is just a step or two behind that. Um, and they can be, they, they're, 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 they work together very effectively, but um, they, they are quite discrete projects. Mm. So you do a, um, what do they call it, a dashboard sort of report to Cabinet each 
each cabinet meeting or every quarter or something like that? Uh, on every your, month. On, on all your projects? Every month? Yeah, all the, all the projects, and particularly the tier one projects, and there's around 45 of those at the and moment. This is, and this is tier one? Yeah. Yep. Okay, but now it was like over a decade of in depth, I think probably globally unrivaled experience now in, in um, oversighting infrastructure uh, and, and delivering infrastructure uh, uh, at, at generally a surplus, um, particularly the T1 to the, to the, to the taxpayer. Uh, you're confident that this is, this is the right decision and uh, going forward in the right direction. Yep, yeah, it's been thoroughly examined. That's the that's the main test for us. Is um, is the strategic um, decision that gets made at the front um, uh, right? Is it been carefully examined? Have other options been? Uh, is there demand for it? All of those underlying assumptions, and then secondly, in the delivery, is it being done cognizant of all the costs and risks and benefits that will be involved? Yes, we're very satisfied with that. Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions now, which you may not be. Uh, your area might be something we should ask transport for initial ask, but yeah, hopefully you can answer them. How critical is this piece of infrastructure, or these two pieces, which are really separate in a, in a sense, um, to the completion of the much talked about, like for all of my life, uh, Sydney Road uh, Network to, the, in terms of the missing pieces? Look, um, I think yeah, it, 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 transport tr transport planners will have a much more um, thorough response to that than I can give. But um, Western Harbour Tunnel, if you take that one um, first, um, it, it is we, we've got uh, we've got um, a limited numbers of harbour crossings. It's a city divided by harbours, uh, yeah. divided by the harbour. Um, we've got um, a couple of crossings, but they are all suffer from congestion. They're all capable of being disrupted by events, as, as those who have to cross them regularly know. Um, having a further crossing adds to the resilience of the of the city um, and the capacity to to grow. Um, and beaches link, you know, I think those who live on the northern beaches uh, would be um, the Spirit loudest in saying that. That they, that they um, have uh, less in the, by the way of, uh, pub, of either public transport or motorway um, assets to service those communities, and they are. Um, uh, it's a very large part of Sydney, um, and so it's it, it's certainly a, what we call a missing element of of the overall network. So, um, and you mentioned <coughs> uh, uh, the Harbour Bridge and <coughs> excuse me, the, the Sydney Harbour Tunnel. Uh, so your assessment would be they're, they're at capacity, probably over capacity, certainly at peak hour now, and there needs to be another crossing of the harbour for motor vehicles. Yeah, there's no question that um, those the, the, those uh, parts of the network can get congested, um, uh, and those who, who, who travel across the harbour bridge regularly uh, would know um, what that's like. Um, and this will clearly add to the capacity of the city to grow and to. Um, uh, to provide to reduce travel times for people who have to make that trip or goods that have to go past that way. No, I think goods is an important point. I mean, did, do you do any assessment? And I heard uh, 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 Miss Boyd um, suggesting perhaps you could carry freight on the met the uh, CBD metro rail rather than on the road system, or alluding to that. Um, so, have you done an assessment? Or do you point do of order. Oh, really? I did no point of order for all of your leading of your witnesses. Point of order. Make a point of order. Thank you. You've misrepresented what I've said there, Mr. Mallard. At no point did I make that suggestion. Thank you. I said you implied. Can I just rule on that? Perhaps I to... I'll withdraw it. Miss Boyd didn't say it. She's totally supporting the project. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, the point I was making is that uh, do you do an assessment of the uh, um, of the uh, economic benefits to uh, of a project like this? So uh, clearly, there's 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 the individual commuter but to my way of thinking it's the economic benefits through freight and business and services that that really multiply the benefit of these projects do, do you do an assessment in that regard yeah that that looked at um, one of the underlying objectives of a lot of this um, particularly uh, transport um, uh, infrastructure is as around productivity uh, and particularly freight productivity um, and capacity for to provide growth in that in that space um, and so this that would have been a major feeder into the uh, business case for, for for this project as it was with WestConnex and and, and others um, and yeah look that the, the public transport projects have don't have that element to them but they have of course they're moving people around cities and we have goals around um, you know 30 minute cities and and ensuring that people can 
um, get get to work, um, get access services. So that's an important part of the portfolio as well. Yeah, I'm amazed how many tradies are on, um, you know, jib rockers or tradies are, are on trains. You know, like they go into the city to work and don't, don't drive in. And I think that's a good outcome of public transport. But you can't move uh, goods, and there's a manufacturing uh, um, hub up at uh, Brookvale and in the Northern Beaches area that uh, supplies to the city. You can't move that on Metro Rail. No, clearly not. No. So you need a, a good road network to extend the business opportunities for these these regions. Which yeah. I'll call it a region. It essentially is a region. Yeah. And, and look, um, uh, you know, the, the thing about Western Harbour Tunnel is it's not sort of an isolated um, uh, road on its own. It connects into West Connex and the, a big part of the business, West Connex case was about moving freight and goods um, on motorways and also getting that, that movement away from um, residences. So by putting a lot of those movements in tunnels and away from um, residential areas, it, it has favourable impacts on those communities as well. I'm not sure if my colleagues have questions, uh, Sam or Trevor. Uh, if it uh, if it was the if it was the tunnel in the Blue Mountains, Sam would be onto it. But uh, <laughs> it's a great project that we're working on. But nonetheless, all yeah. right. Well, that's the end of my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we will look. I mean, um, we've got a few more minutes if Mr. Draper is still willing. So I might yeah, just fine. um yeah, just to compensate, I might look allow members to just seek the call in the next sort of three to four minutes that remain uh, in order to. Ask a question to Mr. Draper. Mr. Draper, I will ask one uh, to kick it off. Uh, mm. The government has publicly said that construction of this project was meant to commence a year and a half ago. Um, did at any point infrastructure in New South Wales warn that the project was running late? Um, I'm not sure of that reference to the commencement of construction a year and a half ago. Um, About two separate. Uh, I'm referring to comments made, I think, in the uh, 18 by the then Transport Minister at a press conference, which was then reported subsequently by the Sydney Morning Herald on at least a few different occasions. Um, it's not really disputed to be fair, but I accept if you might not take the reference. Um, I'll still put the question without perhaps the context, and then you can mm -hmm. tell me whether that's the case or not. Has Infrastructure New South Wales ever warned that this project was running late? The way we would put that, um, it's a fair question. The, the way we would normally put that was not so much whether it was running late, but whether it was, if, if there was government had made a public commitment or had a time frame to which it was working, we would provide a report on whether that was likely to be achieved or not. So that would appear in our regular um, regular reports to cabinet. Um, from our point of view, I guess we're also often cautioning about rushing projects and trying to do them more quickly than they can be um, safely done. Um, uh, because, as you know, from some of the other stuff we've published, uh, our concern is that we do this sort of methodically and in state. So uh, there's a couple of different, it's, it's balancing those things, Jim. Sure, but, but look, I appreciate the context, Mr. Draper, but the question, um, even if you wish to put it in the way you'd put it, um, have you ever issued such a warning that the government was unlikely to make its publicly stated timetable when it comes to this particular project? I'm going to have to go. If we have, it would have been in a cabinet submission, <laughs> so I couldn't comment on it any further. Okay. I might invite Mr. Ma Graham or Mr. Boyd or Mr. Moriarty or Mr. Farrow or Mr. Khan. Um, Mr. Mr. Draper, I might um, return to that uh, question you were asked and started to answer, but perhaps didn't. I'm hoping you didn't complete it. Uh, and that was the question about the Beaches Link uh, business case. You indicated that that was not yet completed but you didn't indicate when you expected that would be completed. When will that be the case? Um, I, th I think probably the best way to say is that the, the, the approval of the business case is not completed. Um, uh, we will have, we, we were, are still providing input on, on that, um, that, that decision. Um, but I would expect that would be done very soon, but it's a question of when the, uh, it's, it's, Really up to the portfolio minister and the um, agency responsible about when they want to bring that forward for decision. So just to be clear, we're talking about the final investment decision there, Mr. Draper. Is that what the part that you're referring to? Yeah. So if there, if if we, if there, if that had been done, I guess the way to say that if that had been done, we would have published a business case summary. Yes. Just yes. No, and that's consistent with the answers we've been getting from transport. This has been hanging around a long while. The analysis is done. What hasn't happened is that the government hasn't made that final investment decision. That's correct, isn't it? 
Um, well, look, I'll, I'll let I'll let the minister, if he's appearing, answer that question because that's sort of getting into a cabinet process itself. But um, I, I guess the best way to say it is that it's going through a lot of thorough analysis. If there was a final decision and a final business case that we could publish a uh, on which we could publish a summary, that we would have done that. One of the concerns that was put to us in evidence was that the uh, benefit cost ratio that you referred to uh, did not include any remediation costs. That seems unusual. Can you give us any uh, brief reflections on that question? So, who, uh, where, where did you get the idea there was no provision for contamination, remediation, sorry? That was one of the uh, views put to us by one of the community groups in a detailed submission. Right. No, I couldn't. I couldn't comment on that. I haven't heard that assertion, but uh, I'll probably just say what I said to Ms. Boyd earlier that um, our reviewers would be examining the adequacy of any contingency um, built into the into the cost structure um, to make sure that those sorts of things were allowed for thoroughly. Uh, we will invite any final questions from Ms. Boyd. Otherwise, we will excuse Mr. Draper. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I'm all right. Okay. Mr. Draper, um, thank you for joining us and um, thank you as well for the, it turns out your internet connection was a lot more stable than we thought. Um, so, yeah. out. Um, thank you very much. I'm not apologies, sure. apologies for that. That's not your fault. Um, I'm not sure whether you took any questions on notice per se, but if you did, you'll have 21 days to return an answer after contacted by the Secretariat. Again, we thank you for taking the time and you're otherwise excused. And we'd invite the Secretariat to please admit that set of witnesses. Thank you. Uh, we welcome our next set of witnesses, uh, representatives of uh, the Department of Planning, Environment, uh, Industry and Environment, as well as the Environmental Protection Authority. Um, firstly, can I just do, check very quickly your sound? Mr. Starting with you, Mr. Gainsford, you can hear us clearly? Yes, I can. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Snow, you can hear us? Uh, yes, I can. And I think we have Mr. Beeman as well. You're, you can hear us, Mr. Beeman? I think you're on mute, Mr. Beeman. Can we just take uh, that off and then? So, sorry, Chair, yes. Thank you very Steve much. Steve Beeman, thank you. Great. Um, Excellent. And we've got Mr. Gaff, Mr. Snow, Mr. Have we got Mr. Hanneman, Ms. Hanneman here with us as well? Yes, thank you. And I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Um, I will just ask each of the witnesses to take an oath or an affirmation, as has been emailed to you by the Secretariat, uh, starting with Mr. Gainsford, please. Thank you. David Gainsford, Deputy Secretary, Assessment and Systems Performance. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr. Snow. Uh, Glenn Snow, Director of Transport Assessments. Um, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And Mr. Beeman. Sorry, Mr. Beeman, you're, you're muted again. Apologies, Chair. Steve Beeman, Executive Director, Regulatory Operations at the New South Wales Environment Protection Authority. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Henneman. Jacinta Hanneman, Acting Director Regulatory Operations at the Environment Protection Authority. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Ms. Hanneman. Uh, can I invite each of the organisations present if they wish to make a short opening statement of no more than three minutes? Um, I'll invite DPIE first if they wish to. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I do have a short statement and the statement I'll be making is actually on behalf of both our department and also the EPA, so it will right. be one statement. Yeah. Uh, I would I would like to thank the, com the committee for the invitation to appear before it and to give evidence to this inquiry. 
My division is responsible for the independent assessment of state significant infrastructure proposals under the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act, including the Western Harbour Tunnel and Ringer Freeway upgrade project and on the Beaches Lincoln Gore Hill Freeway connection project. These projects are at different stages of planning and construction, but are subject to the same detailed and rigorous assessment process. The department's role in this process is extensive. We issue secretary's requirements for the preparation of environmental impact statements, review assessment documentation in consultation with agencies to ensure that they meet those requirements, place environmental impact statements on public exhibition, and then carefully assess them considering advice from key government agencies and independent experts. The assessment of these complex linear infrastructure projects differs to a normal development application process in that a reference or conceptual design is assessed. Following rigorous assessment and a project approval, the proponent must through detailed design and environmental management meet the environmental outcomes prescribed in, in approval, being both proponent commitments and conditions of approval. As such, a project approval will establish the criteria and limits on potential impacts and incorporate a range of ongoing environmental management and monitoring requirements. The EPA is one of the key government agencies that provides advice to the department throughout the planning and assessment process, including providing recommendations to protect the community and environment from the predicted impacts of the project. The department considers the EPA's advice in determining the project and setting the conditions of approval. For both projects, the public exhibition periods exceeded the 28 day statutory requirements, 62 days for Western Harbour Tunnel and 61 days for the Beaches Link to reflect the complexity of these projects. The Western Harbour Tunnel and Ringer Freeway Upgrade Project was approved by the Minister for Planning and Public Spaces on the 21st of January, 2021. Following this determination, my division has a dedicated infrastructure management team, which reviews documents required by the conditions of approval from pre-construction, construction and through to operations. In addition to requirements in the conditions to prepare detailed management plans and reports, the conditions require monitoring of the effectiveness of the mitigation measures and to adaptively respond to risks and impacts. The conditions also contain requirements for regular project audits, both by the project and the independent environment representative and also periodic environmental, uh, periodic independent audits. The findings of these audits feed back specifically into the project documentation to improve the performance of the project. Construction of the project cannot commence until the management and monitoring plans have been approved and an environment protection license is attained from the EPA. The EPA regulates the construction of these projects through environmental protection licenses issued under the Protection of the Environment Operations Act. The EPA will also license the ventilation facilities when the projects are operational. The environment protection licenses issued by the EPA need to be consistent with the project approvals. The department and the EPA share responsibility for regulation of the impacts from the construction of these projects and work collaboratively in our compliance functions. The department regulates the projects against the conditions of approval and the EPA regulates against the conditions of the licenses. Matters that fall under both the approval and license are typically regulated by the EPA. Any person can contact the compliance teams at any stage from pre-construction through to operation of the project if they have concerns around non-compliances, which will be investigated. The exhibition period for the Beaches Link and Gore Hill Freeway Connection proposal concluded in March 2021, and all submissions received have now been provided to Transport for New South Wales, who is now preparing a detailed response to the issues raised. In addition to this, and in consideration of the submissions and independent expert advice, the Department has asked Transport for New South Wales to prepare a preferred infrastructure report which must contain further information to allow proper consideration of the project. I can assure the committee that as with the Western Harbour Tunnel and Ringer Freeway upgrade project, the department will work, will continue to work with relevant agencies, the community and transport for New South Wales to achieve the best outcome possible and provide high quality advice to the minister. We're happy to answer any questions the, com the committee may have. Thank you. Uh can you, Mr. Gainsford, if you haven't already, please email through that opening statement to the Secretariat um, to assist with Hansard, and otherwise we'll go to questions commencing with the opposition, um, and we'll go to Ms. Moriarty. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for joining us today, um, to all of you. Um, 
a number of community groups um, have expressed concern about early works at sites around the Wawinga freeway, um, particularly um, how risk levels of contamination of moderate to high risk uh, are being managed. Um, I've done that through this inquiry, but also um, outside of it. Um, what has been put in place to notify the community uh, of the risks and also the work? So thank you, Ms. Moriarty. Um, so just uh, in, with regard to those um, uh, complaints and those uh, investigations, what I can say is that um, the department is uh, currently investigating um, the, the concerns that have been raised by the community uh, with regard to some of those early works and, and uh, allegations of contamination. Um, we, we have been in contact with the community through those, through those allegations. And as we as we complete our uh, our investigations, we'll we'll certainly make sure we feed back to the community as well. Thanks. So while um, you're investigating it, I mean, obviously these con the community concerns are quite strong, particularly in relation to um, some of the sites near schools and parkland. So have you put? Are there any uh, protections in place uh, between the contaminated sites and the parks and schools? Uh, so the advice that's been provided to me, uh, Ms. Moriarty, is that uh, um, at this point in time, the works that are that are, um, are being carried out are not. Um, we we don't believe are, 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 are causing a high level of uh, potential risk um, in terms of human health, uh, but we continue to work with the contractor um, to to make sure that those works are not having not having risk, and we'll continue to obviously investigate the. Uh, the, the allegations that have been made. Thanks. Um, so perhaps to the EPA, um, I'm told that the Flat Rock Gully site has been notified to you um, as a contaminated, as contaminated under the Contaminated Lands Act. Um, what further testing has been done uh, by you around that site? Just uh, Mr. Hanneman. Oh, sorry, Steve. You go, Jacinta. Sorry, I was. Uh, Jacinta Hanneman from the EPA. So that's correct. So um, we have been notified under the Contaminated Land Management Act of that site by Willoughby Council. Um, that was in February of this year. Council is currently completing some additional investigations at that site and that information is due back to the EPA at the end of October and that information is actually critical for us to then assess the significance of contamination on that site and whether it is actually warranted to be regulated under the Contaminated Land Management Act or not. So it might be worth me just mentioning how contamination is regulated in New South Wales and that's the framework that sits there. Sites that are considered to be significantly contaminated are regulated by the EPA under the Contaminated Land Management Act. Contamination otherwise is regulated through the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act and particularly SEP 55 and also through our accredited site auditors who then assess whether the sites can actually be um, either remediated or can manage to, um, for their existing or their proposed use and verify what happens with that work. So at this stage, this site is still under assessment and the information won't become available until later this year. Thanks. Uh, so when the assessment is completed and that information is available, will it be publicly available? So all the sites that the EPA have assessed to be um, significantly contaminated are put on the public register, which is available on the EPA's website. So there'll be public knowledge as to whether it's a site that the EPA is regulating or not, and if the contamination is deemed to be significant. Uh, thanks. Uh, to um, perhaps the department, um, are you confident that the costs to manage and mitigate the TIP site um, have been provided under the business case? Uh, David Gainsford, uh, Ms. Moriarty, uh, we 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 are not assessing the business case uh, as part of part of the uh, environmental impact assessment, um, so I, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Any comments about whether there's uh, so I, I understand that, I accept that, but in terms of the need for any uh, future works or mitigation, do you assess whether there's any uh, resources so, or money put aside for that? And is so, it enough? 
Well, so certainly from a contamination, and, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, also ask Mr. Snow to, to make some comment here, but certainly as part of the, the assessment um, for the Beaches Link project, we would certainly expect to um, have, have identified all of those contamination, potential contamination risks, and that appropriate mitigation is, uh, is being put in place to, to cover off on that risk. I don't know, Mr. Snow, if you had anything further you wanted to add. Uh, Glenn Snow, um, David is correct in saying that we will we'll thoroughly assess the the the, the, um, the contamination status of the site, having regard to the, the Contaminated Land Management Act, um, and if necessary, we'll, we'll put in appropriate conditions if recommendation is recommend approval is recommended. Um, the actual costs of those those works is a matter for transport for New South Wales. Thanks. Uh, and just on that tip site, do you know if there was any um, consideration given to bypassing it altogether? One um, of the Glenn Snow here again. One of the um, questions we've reached, we've asked from Transport for New South Wales, is further information on the analysis of different sites for that ancillary facility. Um, okay, um, so again to the EPA, the Camaray Golf Club site, um, has that been notified to you under the Contaminated Lands Act, similar to the last one? Uh, Jacinta Hanneman, no, that site has not been notified to the EPA under the Contaminated Land Management Act. We are actually regulating the early works um, of the Raringa Freeway upgrade under an environment protection licence at the moment and works at that site are covered and regulated under that environment protection licence. Thanks. It's close to a sports field and a kids playground. Are you, are you aware of any issues uh, at that site? So yeah, we've I, it. So the conditions that exist in the licence are to protect the community both from um, noise, water and air quality impacts. So there's some fairly standard conditions that are on that licence that relate to the minimisation of the generation of dust. We have received one complaint since the licence was in place um, since the end of May um, and that was in relation to dust. And the EPA goes through a process every um, complaint or report that comes to the EPA, we do investigate and that typically might involve us getting in contact with the complainant initially, but also the licensee requesting documentation and information. Um, we may undertake site inspections as well. And then with all that information, we make a determination as to whether um, any action is undertaken or not. Thanks. Um, so throughout this the hearing so far, uh, and also outside of it, there's been quite a number of concerns raised by uh, most of the local communities, but also uh, local community groups um, about the what they say is a lack of consultation um, or that strong objections that have been submitted in relation to uh, elements of the project have been essentially ignored. Um, so particularly concerning um, for a lot of groups that they feel as though they weren't heard or this was rushed um, in COVID conditions. Do you have any views on that or comments on that? Uh, David Gainsford here. Um, just just a point of clarification, Ms. Moriarty, are you you're referring to the Beaches Link project in that yeah. question? Yeah. Um, so, so with regard to, uh, I guess, just going back to my opening statements, um, certainly the EIS for the Beaches Link uh, was exhibited for um, more than double the 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 minimum period of time. Um, we, we do look to continue to engage with uh, community groups and certainly uh, we received a number of submissions that came through as part of the EIS exhibition process. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll continue to ensure that there's lots of engagement with the community. Thanks, we've heard some specific concerns from um, some local school uh, and community groups in relation to uh, air quality issues, uh, particularly well, for the longer term, once the project's completed, but also um, during construction. Uh, one of the things that came up last week was concern, particularly in relation to the reopening of schools and construction um, during the COVID, uh, uh, the impacts of COVID, given that schools will have been told to have their windows shut, etc. Um, do you have any views on that uh, and on air quality issues in general that have been raised? 
uh, David Gainsford again. Uh, yes, so uh, again, uh, with regard particularly, to, obviously, to uh, Western Harbour Tunnel, which is um, uh, the project that, that obviously has received approval, um, certainly there are a number of strict requirements, strict conditions of approval that relate to uh, to the management of uh, noise and dust and, and, and various other uh, amenity impacts associated with those with those uh, with those projects. So um, certainly we would have an anti an expectation, and, and we have also reached out to to some of those school communities that have been raising issues with us uh, to ensure that those works are well managed. And, and Ms. Hanneman was also mentioning, uh, I guess, the role that the uh, EPA plays in, in in that as well. Uh, thanks. Also, um, through this process, we've had concerns from, again, local communities, but also local councils in relation to uh, potential damage to uh, some public uh, swimming spots, baths near uh, dredging sites, particularly Jordan Fraser baths, the Greenwich baths and Northbridge. Have you got any views on potential damage and any response to their concerns? Yes, so David Gainsford, uh, again, Ms Moriarty. So, uh, yes, I did. I did. Uh, see those concerns that have been raised um, with regard to particularly the Dawn Fraser baths. Um, I, I would note that they are quite some distance away from where the um, uh, where the proposed immersed tube tunnel uh, works uh, are proposed to happen. Um, what I would say with regard to um, the, the the requirements uh, within the within the uh, planning approval for for those proposed works is that uh, the assessment uh, itself. Um, did provide predictions of, of what the impacts are likely to be and put mitigations forward, um, uh, which, which uh, I guess we, as part of our assessment, accepted would would uh, reduce uh, the the um, potential impacts of, of uh, sediment um, and also toxins um, leaving leaving the site. Um, but the other thing I guess I would I would uh, make mention of is that there are very detailed um, dredging and disposal management plans that are required uh, as part of the conditions of approval. Um, so uh, once, once Transport for New South Wales has selected a preferred contractor um, and has finalised their design for um, how they'll undertake those works, uh, there's a very detailed management plan that uh, will need to come to the department um, that, that will provide uh, further detail around uh, how, those, how those impacts are going to, be, uh, going to be managed and mitigated. Thanks. And just a couple of questions before I hand over to my uh, colleagues for the last um, part of our time here. Just um, concerns about uh, increased or project, the pro some project documents refer, in fact, to a really large increase um, in the number of heavy vehicles using the Warringah Freeway corridor if the tunnels are built. Um, so leading to significant diesel emission increases. Uh, have you got any views around or comments on that? Uh, particularly the health concerns in relation to that. Wondering if Mr. Mr. Snow, you might want to um, tackle that question. Thanks, David. Uh, Glenn Snow here. The, the assessment did identify um, increases and decreases in air quality um, throughout the project. Um, and those increases were primarily located along the Warringah Freeway. Um, as can be expected, as heavy vehicles will be directed onto that corridor and away from, from other routes. So that was an expected outcome. Um, notwithstanding that, the health impact assessment identified that that would not pose a significant risk to human health. Thanks. And just one final question before I hand over to my colleagues. Um, so according to some of the EIS documents, these projects will remove over three and a half thousand trees, place 63 threatened species at further risk, uh, impact up to 20 significant Aboriginal sites, uh, and many more impacts than that. Uh, what are your comments on whether this meets requirements around climate uh, and sustainability issues into the future? Yes, so David Gainsford. Um, so with regard to the Western Harbour Tunnel uh, project, um, one of the the conditions of approval requires uh, that any trees that are removed um, are replaced at a ratio of two to one, um, and that's that's consistent with um, a number of uh, major infrastructure projects that we've assessed in the past. Um, with regard to the Beaches Link uh, project, obviously that's an assessment that's underway. Um, so whilst I note those um, 
those those aspects that you've mentioned there around biodiversity and uh, and tree removal, which we'll obviously thoroughly assess. Um, we we haven't finalised that assessment. That's 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 underway at the moment. I might, in the remaining time, just put that last uh, reiterate that last point about the flat rock gully that my colleagues uh, put. To me, that was some of the most um, concerning evidence. Uh, particularly about just the scale of that regional tip that operated there, particularly the refrigeration factory, uh, producing uh, 1,200 refrigerators a week, uh, chrome plating, uh, potent potentially generating hexavalent chrome and PFAS, uh, open burning going on at the tip, uh, possible dioxins due to the burning of plastics. The evidence that's been given to us is there's no references to the factory or to these potential con contaminants in the EIS. If they're not identified, they might not be test for, tested for. Uh, what does either agency say about uh, why these aren't referred to, why these haven't been appropriately identified? Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, David Gainsford here. I might, I might sort of uh, kick off and and then uh, see if my colleagues would like to um, offer further. So uh, again, making reference to the Beaches Link, obviously that's midway through assessment. Um, part of the process that uh, I mentioned in my opening statement is that all of the submissions, which um, I know include issues that that have been raised um, with regard to contaminants, potential contaminants associated with the old tip site at Flat Rock Drive. Um, have been forwarded to to Transport for New South Wales to respond to and their and their expert consultants to respond to. Um, I also mentioned that there's also a requirement for a preferred infrastructure report because we have identified that there were some gaps in the assessment, um, and so we're requiring some further information to come to come through as part of that preferred infrastructure report. So we would expect that all of those issues that you that you have raised and have been raised in submissions will be addressed by uh, Transport for New South Wales. Thank you. Uh, we will no. go to the crossbench, um, unless I believe Mr. Beeman has a little bit more to add. Sorry, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Beeman, Mr. Graham, just to follow up on your question about uh, Flat Rock Gully, just to put on the record, we com our comment on that EIS identified that it was only a desktop uh, assessment done to date and that a detailed site investigation was required to determine any risk and what any remediation measures might be. And that's what then dovetails into what Ms Hanneman talked about was the notification by Willoughby Council of the gully to us in February this year. And we're expecting further reports from Council to be delivered to us in late October. But um, that risk you identified is um, was one that we also identified and raised in the EIS submissions. Thank you, Mr Beeman. Um, Ms Boyd. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to all of you for making yourselves available um, this afternoon. Um, there is a lot to get through in terms of what we've been hearing from um, community groups in terms of concerns around various um, environmental impacts and health impacts. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that um, my colleagues raised. Just firstly, in relation to the comment on the trees and the, the policy to uh, plant two new trees for every one tree. Um, Where's that policy? You said that it was a, um, sorry, Mr. Gainsford, you said that it was a, um, that was standard. Where does that come from? Is that a, is that a standard policy for all projects? And if so, why? Yeah, David Gainsford here. Uh, so it is, it's a condition of approval um, uh, for the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beach, uh, Western Harbour Tunnel and River Freeway upgrade. Um, there's a similar condition that we have applied on a number of other major linear infrastructure projects. Um, some organisations have their own policies in terms of tree replacements, um, and there are obviously biodiversity offsets that are required um, for impacts on endangered ecological communities. Um, but this is trying to capture, I guess, the removal of the trees that sit outside of those communities. Um, so, yeah, so it's a condition of approval. So is, it, is that um, legislated or is that something that the department decides in terms of it being a standard condition? It's 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 the same as it's the same as uh, any other condition of approval in terms of the the uh, um, I, gu I guess the requirements uh, that that are that have a legal um, standing any any condition of approval 
uh, has, Sorry, has my that. question is, is whether you have, whether the department has discretion to change that or whether it's something that you're bound um, to because it's in, in some sort of governing legislation. Yes, so thank you. Um, so there isn't, so we're not following a, uh, a specific uh, guideline or, or, or piece of legislation in, in formulating this, but um, it, is, it is obviously reflecting, I guess, partly the community concerns that have been raised about true removal on projects. Yeah and also reflecting, uh, I guess, commitments of the department um, and, and I know the minister has been making uh, with regard to um, uh, planting of trees, um, particularly within Western Sydney. And how long has this particular two for one um, condition been a standard? Um, I, I, would, I, would need to, I would need to take that on notice, but there's certainly been a number of projects where we've, where we've applied similar similar. I ask because I think, you know, in light of the recent IPCC report, what we now know about climate, the importance of um, mature trees versus, um, you know, saplings, um, there is obviously a huge amount of science in the last few years in particular that has pointed to, to why are two, two um, new trees for one old growth tree is um, not necessarily best practice anymore. Um, is that something that will be reviewed by the department? The department is open to changing its approach on? Uh, we're, we're, Ms. Ms. Boyd, yes, we're always, uh, we're always open um, for, for feedback in terms of the application of our conditions. Um, as I say, some, some agencies actually uh, put forward uh, higher standards. Um, certainly from our point of view, we've been applying this two to one ratio for, for some period of time, but yes, we're always open to, to, mm. to feedback Sug on conditions. I guess it needs to be updated. Thank you. Um, perhaps um, just one more question for you, um, Mr. Gainsford. I understand that uh, Jacob's group completed the EIS technical review, um, but they are also now one of the contractors um, being awarded the early works. Um, and also responsible for some of the detailed site investigations and testings. How is the conflict of interest managed? Uh, so uh, ultimately, uh, both those contracts would be transport for New South Wales contracts rather than contracts with the department. So the department obviously plays a, a role in assessing the environmental impact assessment and any, any subsequent uh, documentation that comes through. Um, so the, the actual letting of those contracts that you've mentioned there really is a matter for transport for New South Wales. Would it be usual practice to have um, a, a group that is going to be involved in the construction um, preparing um, the EIS technical review? Uh, it would be hard for me to answer about whether that's usual or not. Um, certainly the, the conditions of approval do talk to um, uh, areas of, of additional work that happens uh, once once the conditions are in place, uh, where we require independent um, independent consultants and independent technical advice uh, mm -hmm. as part of as part of those areas. So we're quite clear in terms of where we highlight where there's potential risks um, and and where we require that independence. Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to make comment uh, with with regard to this this. Uh, um, uh, this issue that you've raised. My understanding is that ordinarily this this um, this review would be take, undertaken by someone who is independent. Um, if indeed they're not uh, independent by virtue of a conflict of interest, um, would that impact on the department's assessment of the EIS? Uh, well, obviously, uh, uh, with with regard to is is this a sorry if I can just ask a clarifying question is, is it with regard to the beaches link or is it with regard to Western Harbour Tunnel? Um, mm, it's a very good question. Um, I believe it's to do with Western Harbour Tunnel. I don't know if it's also beaches link, but it's definitely Western Harbour Tunnel. Okay, so with with regard to the Western Harbour Tunnel, uh, obviously we we've already assessed that that project, um, and so our, our assessment process for that project has has been completed. So um, that there would be uh, no ability for us to reassess um, with with regard to uh, I guess the the ongoing works that you're um, saying is is being done by this organisation. It would really depend on on. Um, what the conditions of approval say um, are the requirements for for that work. Whether those, uh, whether there are any uh, further management plan documentation that's coming to the department as as a result of those conditions uh, requires our approval, 
um, and, and obviously that independence uh, aspect that I was referring to before. I will um, take it up further with Transport for New South Wales. Thank you. Um, perhaps if I could turn to um, the EPA, um, just picking up on the questions that my um, colleague, Ms Moriarty, was asking in relation to air pollution. This is another one of those areas where there's been a huge amount of, um, of, of new knowledge acquired in relation to air pollution globally in the last few years, um, but also a lot has changed in the last couple of years since the EIS um, was produced. Particularly, we've had the bushfires. Um, we've now got COVID restrictions and the um, schools being told that they need to keep windows open. Hasn't there been significant change um, sufficient to warrant perhaps re, you know, taking another look at the air pollution impacts of this project? Oops, sorry, it's Boyd Steve Beeman from the EPA. Um, so in relation to the sort of the health impacts of emissions from um, from this project, they there have been there were two processes that occurred. One was the uh, the review by the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer, and one that's also a requirement that the Chief Health Officer actually uh, verify the the air quality modelling, including including the health impacts, and so that. Those assessments by those two eminent um, eminent bodies had been undertaken in terms of the um, air emission work. Um, so uh, I think it's the those independent reviews give us confidence that the air modelling work that's been done and presented in the EIS is 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 appropriate. So so just to clarify then, so once once an EIS has been undertaken as at a certain date, it doesn't matter how much changes after that time the EPA won't step in to put new conditions on to take into account the new circumstances? Oh, we'll, all, we'll, we'll, we'll always consider new information, but the information that we've got to date um, is that, and it was part of the assessment review done by the Office of Chief Scientist and also uh, the Chief Health Officer, um, verified that the assessments and the modelling done to date in terms of the human health impacts uh, were appropriate, and that was our and that was supported by our internal uh, expert review by our own air specialists at the time. At the time. Um, do you acknowledge that um, Dr Kerry Champ was only asked to review the stack contributions um, of the project and not the whole of the project in terms of its contribution to health outcomes? I might get my colleagues to talk around the role of the Office of Chief Scientist and and, um, and the Chief Health Officer because that's it's more in terms of the planning framework. Yes, David David Gainsford here, and 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 uh, Mr. Snow might be able to help me with my answer here. But um, as Mr. Beeman's referring to there, uh, the 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 assessment process, um, which which includes the chief uh, the chief scientist and the chief health officer, um, has also included uh, reviews from internationally uh, from international consultants that have that have helped uh, with that assessment. Um, and has also we, we also as part of the process that we've done, uh, we we had an air quality specialist um, give us advice uh, in helping to helping to set the parameters for for the conditions of approval. The the last thing I guess I would say um, with regard to your your question is that um, also one of the conditions of approval that we we have in place is that if there are new technologies or 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 um, or different methodologies that uh, that arise, um, you know, both during the um, the construction and operation of the, of the of the project, um, there there are requirements for for those to be um, incorporated into the design, uh, and if needed, retrofitted into into the tunnel. So, um, we're we're trying to ensure that um, the best available uh, advice and technology. Uh, can continue to be incorporated into into the design, um, Miss, Mr. Snow. I'm not sure if you have anything to add there. The only thing I, I would add is that we do assess the department does assess and as does its independent reviewer assess both internal and ambient air quality as well. So not just um, um, outlet emissions. But I, I should say is is that the outlet emissions are the key determiner on of ambient air quality as well in relation to the outlet emissions. 
So can I just confirm though, my question was, is it true that Dr. Kerry Chant was only asked to review the stack contributions um, in terms of overall health outcomes and not the overall project? So for example, um, the sort of extra congestion in, in certain areas that we've heard um, will be a product of this um, project, the um, additional congestion and dust during construction, um, the number of access changes to Warringa Freeway, there is a, a bunch of non-stack related um, emissions that when you have so many school children and children um, generally in that area, that assessing the health outcomes of the whole project might have made more sense. Can you confirm that she only looked at the, the stack emissions? Uh, Glenn Snow here. I, I can't comment on whether um, Dr. Chan reviewed in relation to the construction impacts, but I do know that the department does liaise with New South Wales Health through the assessment as well. So we would have liaised with New South Wales Health with it, but on those broader um, non operational issues. My, my understand is that that advice provided in relation to the IES is primarily related to operational impacts. Um, I'm finding it difficult to understand why, um, why, no, let me take a step back. Do you believe that there is sufficient monitoring and data available of current um, air pollution in the impacted areas from this project? Mr. Mr. Snow, you, are you happy to? Sure. Um, I think so, yes, both from a construction operational um, circumstance. Um, and in both those situations as well is that there will be further monitoring undertaken during both both construction and operation. Um, in relation to construction, the proponent is required to develop an uh, air quality monitoring program, which will be done in consultation with the EPA um, and the broader community, um, as will as will the operational um, monitoring as well. And so, what will what will happen when there is um, a um, when there's a, a notification that there has been an air pollution event near a school, what is the what is the action that then gets taken to protect those children? Mr. Snow, are you able to? Look, it's probably uh, a question better to asked answered by the EPA or, or compliance person. Um, but look, happy to to provide advice, particularly in relation to, to operational matters. Um, so it, the operational performance is actually um, live and and as real time as possible, and that is identified in a, in a on a public website and has been for recent tunnels as well. Um, I think if, there are, uh, if there are exceedances, then that gets reported to both the department, EPA, and New South Wales Health. I appreciate that. My concern is with those schools that are also being told to keep their windows open when they return. Um, and for the foreseeable future, um, living with COVID, um, we're asking for maximum ventilation. But at the same time, we are building projects that are increasing the amount of air pollution around those schools. What are those schools supposed to do? Close the windows or open the windows? So David Gainsford here. Um, so Ms. Boyd, oh, I guess maybe uh, talking to the overall assessment that was done for Western Harbour Tunnel and the air quality assessments, um, the, the assessments themselves um, predicted uh, at various point sources, some increases and some and, and decreases uh, in, in, uh, in pollutant levels. But what I would say is that the, the, the levels of impact um, that were predicted where there were increases uh, were quite uh, quite small, um, and the the predictions uh, have suggested that um, none of the none of the uh, air quality uh, levels would be would be exceeded at those at those points. So, again, the monitoring system that's been that's been put in place is obviously designed to um, ensure that the the modelling itself um, was accurate, but also that what actually happens uh, in effect. Um, uh, doesn't lead to doesn't lead to those um, uh, potential impacts that you've referred to there. But what I would say is that the evidence that's been provided uh, as part of the assessment is that um, you know the impacts where they are increases are, are very low. 
Thank you. We'll go to the government members uh, now, although I think I may have inadvertently cut someone off. Is that you, Mr. Uh, it was it was me. Uh, I, I could give you some further advice to Ms. Boyd um, in relation to compliance. My understanding is that if we did receive um, advice that there was exist, exist an exceedance during construction, that the department's compliance team would engage with the EPA and would either have those works cease or or different or, or additional mitigation measures in, um, implemented. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Um, we'll go to government members. Uh, I think Mr. Mallard, are you taking the call? It would appear so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's an interesting conversation around. Uh, I thank you for appearing today in this inquiry during such a hectic time for government uh, employees and, and um, organisations. Um, there's an interesting conversation from Ms. Boyd around uh, narrowing down health outcomes. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can answer this, but there's plenty of evidence from overseas studies, academics around the fact that uh, freeways and motorways and, and roads have increased health benefits, economic benefits to. Uh, individual people, greater freedom and greater access to health care. So is that in terms of the population health approach, uh, has, has there been a look at the health benefits to greater access to our city from the new motorways that are being built? Uh, Ms. Uh, David Gainsford here. Uh, yeah, so as part of as part of the assessments, um, as part of the environmental impact assessment that was uh, conducted for uh, Western Harbour Tunnel and also for the Beaches Link, obviously there's a whole series of um, uh, impacts that are looked at from both a positive and negative point of view, and and obviously you're pointing to uh, um, those accessibility uh, aspects that are that are uh, obviously. Uh, um, one of the drivers for 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 these types of projects. Um, so yes, yeah, so on the on the balance of weighing up all of those um, all of those aspects of projects, um, you know, we we concluded for Western Harbour Tunnel that was in the public interest. So, so they're weighed up against uh, sort of short term narrow uh, impacts, say say from construction, which you still try to manage very carefully, but they're all weighed up into the sort of bigger equation. That, that's that's correct. We do weigh up all of those issues. That's correct. That's very good to hear. Um, I have some questions uh, to um, the EPA. I think um, relating to evidence that we heard from um, retired. Well, I don't know if they're retired, but I think they were um, uh, um, uh, scientists, for want a better term, at our last inquiry regarding um, the assessment of the impacts of the harbour tunnel on the uh, sediments in the harbour. I don't think this, these questions have been canvassed at all. Uh, it, was, it was suggested, I, I assume, and I hope that the, our friends from the EPA have uh, reviewed that evidence. It was suggested that uh, the, the um, environmental impact statement was uh, inadequate because it didn't address the issue of uh, ocean currents and them coming into the harbour. And there's a suggestion that the sediments that were stirred up would wind up at Parramatta. Uh, would the EPA like to comment upon the uh, allegation, for want of a better term, that the uh, e EIS work was was lacking in that in that area? Yep, Steve Beeman, uh, Mr. Mallard, thank you for that question. Um, and it's not a Dorothy Dix, so I, I'm generally interested in that answer. Yes, no, no, absolutely. Uh, look, it, all dredging operations, you know, are, you know, present significant environmental challenges, no matter where we've um, had to regulate these. And I think you know the protection of Sydney Harbour's water quality values is absolutely paramount, um, and the EPA hears that you know, the communities are uh, the communities call around protecting Sydney Sydney's Harbour water quality very loudly and clearly. And our views are very aligned in the community in that respect. We don't want to see any diminution um, of the water quality values in the harbour. Um, and just a couple of points to note before I answer your question directly is. Um, we've had pretty extensive experience in regulating dred dredging operations and particularly those that are in sort of contaminated sediments. So um, we've had experience in Homebush Bay, Port Kembla Harbour, Kendall Bay, Hunter River and, and the uh, redevelopment and um, placement of material for the Barangaroo headland. So there's a lot of practical experience and particularly around Sydney Harbour and particular around uh, the regulation of those sites. So, but based on the information that we uh, had and saw in the EIS and some follow-up information that we'd actually got from the proponent and transport from New South Wales, 
um, we we firmly um, had the view that um, that the risk um, that all the risks had been identified and uh, could be addressed under the approved management plans. Um, that issue, I think, uh, um, the issue about the hydrodynamics in the harbour was actually um, pretty well documented in one of the technical attachments in the EIS by memory. Appendix P, I think it is. Um, it's looked, important to note that because that was a very strong criticism of your assessment. Of yeah. The, uh, and so Appendix P um, did, a, did a, there was a, an extensive uh, modelling of the hydrodynamics, the the flow of the, the flows within the harbour, and then the modelling from that on where uh, if there were to be turbidity impacts and uh, what the nature of those impacts are, and and they were they were pretty well documented in the uh, in the EIS. Were you involved in the um, EIS uh, assessment? No, I, uh, I I lead the team to do it. So Jacinta um, looks after Hanneman looks after leads those teams, but we use our teams inside the EPA across a range of technical expertise. So noise, water, air, and contaminated lands to give us that technical expertise. My colleagues, my colleagues might correct me, but from memory, uh, it was suggested that uh, you forgot to do the assessment and, sit and put in an assessment like at the a minute to midnight before the the requirement to provide that assessment. From memory, yeah. suggested. Uh, would you like to defend uh, the, the work you've done, your team, and uh, in that regard to that allegation? Yeah, look, absolutely. And it was a little, a little bit disappointing to hear that. In yeah. that, um, and I've got great regard for the for for the, just... um, for the gentleman that actually did that. He's um, highly respected by by myself and my colleagues. Um, there seems to be some sort of unusual view in the community because we did it on the last day. We seem to have forgot about it. Mm. Um, I was sort of reflecting on how to answer that question, and I was almost thinking about when I was at uni. You're going to submit that to the very end because I want to give my guys the maximum amount of time Guilty. to actually to, to get into the detail. Um, so it wasn't a case of we did it on the last day and we forgot about it. As soon as these um, these projects come into our office. The teams are activated. They're looking. They're looking through them as quickly as we can, and we're probably a little bit to Mr. Gainsford's frustration. We're giving him advice at the very last time that we have to, so we can maximize maximize our time reviewing them. So it certainly wasn't a case of the uh, assessment being uh, missed. Thank you, Mr. Beeman, and I'm really pleased to have put that on the record because I thought that was. I, I really thought that was a bit unfair, uh, given um, the professionalism of the EPA. Um, the uh, um, Sorry, uh, Mr. Snow, Director of Transport Assessments in the Department of Planning. Sounds sounds like a very important role. Um, would you like to comment on the issue of, and I raised this earlier on, uh, earlier witness, about the, um, and if this is your area, the assessment of the fact that this is one of the sort of last missing links of the road network talked about from the 60s. Uh, for uh, around Sydney, uh, CBD and, metro and sort of inner metropolitan Sydney, uh, in regards to this project, uh, how important it is for that last missing link. Uh, thank, thank you, Shane. Um, Millard, Millard. Um, what I can say about that is that the focus of our assessments is actually on the environmental impacts of the project. So. Um, we do report on the strategic business case and, and, and how that fits within government policy, um, and that's that's documented in our assessments. But but the focus of our assessments is in relation to the environmental impacts. Yeah, okay, that's why you're in the in in the department of planning, though, aren't you? Yes, yes. For the environmental impacts. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, that's clear to me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so. Um, Back to the EPA then, uh, we had, and this is a perennial issue, and I, I have identified in uh, previous inquiries and in this one that uh, in, the, in um, the 2000 period when I was a councillor in South Sydney and City of Sydney, campaigned against stacks in East Sydney and Stanley Street and others, and worked hard to try and get filtration. Now, I've, had, I've been briefed thoroughly and read many documents on stacks and the latest technology and the fact that exhaust emissions are much more today, much more filtered just from the car, a little under the top of fuel. But um, can you outline the EPA's role in the ongoing uh, licensing and management of, of, of uh, exhaust stacks? I might get Ms Hanneman to be able to respond to that one, Mr Mallard. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Just into Hanneman. So, look, the EPA regulates emissions from the tunnel ventilation outlets through environment protection licenses. 
and the licenses themselves are very much outcomes focused. So they will include air emission discharge limits for those ventilation outlets, but they don't actually prescribe how those limits need to be achieved. So the license, for example, won't prescribe that they need to filter the tunnels. It simply sets what the discharge emission limits need to be. Makes and those sense. discharge limits are actually um, determined looking at what the ambient air quality criteria that needs to be met at the receptors. So there's modelling that works out, you know, what those <coughs> actual criteria should be. I hate that term receptors. You're talking about the human population yeah, that, around the Residents, state. absolutely. <laughs> That's exactly right. The community. Uh, yeah, I had I had that in the choir of school kids called receptors. I thought it took, well, not a very attractive term. Um, so, uh, so instead of it seems like a panacea that to um, which which attracted me in the early two thousands to whack in uh, uh, filters, but it's is there, are there other methods uh, that can be employed to maintain the air quality, which a filter would if it even work would do. So what what would the a tunnel operator do to manage it if there was heavy, maybe tr you know, traffic jam of trucks or something. How would they manage that air emission to to reduce it to to make to maintain that um, output that is the level you require? So I can't specifically comment on exactly what they would do because I'm not a technical person myself, but I do understand there's a range of measures that they can um, undertake. What I can comment on is since the EPA has actually been licensing um, the ventilation outlets from these tunnels, the, we have had a number of exceedances reported to us, but they have never been in relation to the actual performance or the operation of the motorway tunnel. So, for example, um, I think West Connects is a good example, the M4, M8 tunnels. So, we've had a licence in place since July 2020, and they've had 12 exceedances that have been reported to us. And six of those were in relation to um, dust within inside the tunnel when they first started off. So, it was the re residual construction dust, some were instrumentation error, and some were related to regional air quality impacts, such as hazard reduction burns and, and bushfires that were happening. So they're, they're all not related to actual exhaust emissions? That's correct. Okay, yes. so who reports that to you? Is that uh, automatically triggered by a monitoring system inside the stack or, do, or does the operator monitor it and then by law, as happens in some other examples, then automatically have to report to you the, the, the exceedance? That's correct, it's the latter. So they're doing, they've got their real time monitoring and there's a requirement both in the conditions of approval and also in the license for them to actually report that through to us. And so they report those exceedances to the Department of Planning, to New South Wales Health and to the EPA. Real, real time reporting, like, like within 24 hours, 12 hours? I can't recall what the time is, but on, it is a short period of time. That's correct. You take that on notice. Just let us know yes. how quickly they report that. Oh, what are your remedies then when uh, an exceedance? Obviously, you've investigated those other ones, and work, and maybe they maybe they gave you the advice about what they believe the problem was. What what are the EPA's remedies? You've got a license. Do you, are you in a position to, to 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 give them warnings about their license to emit from their tunnel? So that's correct. There's a whole range of actions that the EPA can do. So yes, the proponent of the licensee is required to provide the reports to us and we review those to determine whether, um, I guess, the conclusions that have been formed satisfy us. And then, as you say, we've got the license that sits in place. So if we're concerned in terms of what the monitoring results are showing, we can vary that license to include additional conditions. And often what we would use is something like a pollution reduction program. But as you also mentioned, there's a whole range of compliance actions that the EPA can take. Um, if there's an alleged breach, and we would look at that to see whether it warrants something like, you know, an advisory letter through to formal warnings, penalty notices and the like. So there's a range of action that can be taken. Two more questions on that, on, on along the, the stacks, because it, it, it's a, a real big issue of concern anywhere they are. Um, <clears throat> the um, uh, transparency of that data and the transparency for the community of what's going on out of their stack. You want to comment on that? So my understanding is that that um, monitoring data is available to the community. Uh, like live on a website or they've got to make an application to get that? Um, I'm not aware if it's live. I'm not sure if my planning colleagues could advise could you, that. Could you take out a notice? And it might be yes, we can definitely take out a notice. Yeah, that I suggest I might look at in a recommendation. I think the community would have more confidence if they knew 
daily they could look at a um, data from Councillor Mallard. It's that's uh, sorry, um, Senator Mallard. It's Glenn Snow here. Um, <laughs> Did you say Senator? No. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, it, it is uh, a publicly yeah. available on on websites. Yes. So, okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Uh, and my and my other question, sort of um, the other day uh, in evidence, we heard. Um, I was sort of laughed at when I suggested that electric vehicles, 55% of the fleet we expect within 20 to 30 years. But for the EPA, that must be, uh, you know, a, a goal and a golden light on the horizon for pollution. Electric vehicles replacing diesel and and, uh, and petroleum. Yeah, Steve Bayman here. Thanks, Mr. Mallard. You're absolutely correct. I think. A lot of the um the the ambient regional air quality issues that we face, and particularly in the Sydney Basin, are often driven by our transport sources, being that motor vehicles and trucks. And so, uh, the positive movement that's been made by the community to move towards you know electric vehicles, um, and, and the greening of fleets is going to have a significant improvement. Well, on led and led by the state government, which is converting totally to electric vehicles and our bus fleet uh, yeah. over a period of time, yeah, uh, showing leadership. Well, right, Mr. Chair, that uh, ends my line of questioning. I don't know if my colleagues have any, but uh, thank you well, for the time. The time has expired, Mr. Mallard. No, 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 no. The government needs more time. Uh, oh, I'm misplaced. <laughs> I need to move an extension. I'm sure. But anyway, um, I thank the witnesses for their appearance. Witnesses have taken some questions on notice, for which you'll have 21 days to return an answer after you receive the transcript from the Secretariat. We will now go on a break, and we'll reconvene at 2:35. Uh, to do our final session. Um, I would remind members to mute yourselves and turn off your cameras unless you would like to broadcast your goings on to the internet. Thank you very much.
I will now resume the hearing. Uh, I welcome our next set of witnesses from Transport for New South Wales. Uh, uh, Mr. Ms. Drover and Mr. Paris. Ms. Drover, you can hear us fine? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Mr. Paris, you can too? I can, yes. Thank you. Just turn my volume up, but yes, fine. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll now ask each of the witnesses to take either an oath or an affirmation after you state your name and your position, starting with you, Ms. Drover. Uh, Camilla Drover, Deputy Secretary, Infrastructure and Place, Transport for New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Paris. Thank you, Mr. Mulkey. Uh, so, Doug Paris uh, uh, from Transport for New South Wales, uh, Director of Project uh, Development for the Eastern Harbour and Central River Cities. Uh, and I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Paris. Uh, can I invite either of you to make a short opening statement on behalf of Transport for New South Wales of no more than three minutes? Yes, I, I'm to make the opening statement and we are cognizant of three minute rule. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past and present. I recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing call for connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. Sydney is a rapidly growing city. By 2056, it will become a global city of nearly 8 million people similar in size to New York and London, with more people than ever before accessing our integrated transport network. To prepare for this growth, we must invest in world-class infrastructure that will not only reduce congestion, but contribute to the overall livability of our communities. One of our key areas of focus is to complete the missing links of Sydney's motorway network and improve traffic flow to support the growth of our communities, places and economy, so people and goods can move safely and reliability around our city and beyond. The Western Harbour Tunnel will create a western bypass of the Sydney CBD, taking pressure off the heavily congested Sydney Harbour Bridge, Sydney Harbour Tunnel and Anzac Bridge. Beaches Link will revolutionise how we move between the northern beaches and the rest of Sydney, providing an alternative to the Spit Bridge and the Moringa Road corridors. Importantly, the program has been designed to focus on new public transport connections and improve journey times and reliability for buses. By putting traffic underground in tunnels, we will reduce traffic on local streets, improve public and active transport options for cyclists and pedestrians, and unlock opportunities for urban renewal. The program of this scale is also expected to unlock uh, 15,000 full-time equivalent jobs in construction. I acknowledge that building a project of this scale and complexity will have unavoidable impacts on the community and the environment. We are not only building the first road tunnel uh, under Sydney Harbour in 30 years, 
but we're upgrading one of Australia's busiest and most complex roads. And we're working in an urban environment where people live, work, learn and play. That is why we carried out one of the most extensive community and stakeholder engagement processes uh, for a program associated with the road project. And this is since the project was announced in 2017. From the early design stages through the public uh, exhibition of the environmental impact statements, we've engaged actively uh, and listened to the communities and stakeholders to hear their feedback, understand their concerns and what is important to them. The project has held online and in-person community information sessions, hosted market stalls, met with key stakeholders and community groups, carried out thousands of door knocks, produced online interactive websites, published and distributed fact sheets, community updates, flyers, and were readily okay. and are readily available via phone and email to answer questions. This critical feedback has helped us to refine the design, identify opportunities to improve, uh, to deliver improved place-based community outcomes and reduce our community impacts wherever possible. We will continue to proactively engage with communities and stakeholders throughout construction with targeted engagement strategies so we can further, further reduce the impacts. On behalf of Transport for New South Wales, we welcome today's opportunity to answer questions on um, the Public Works Committee's uh, questions on the Western Harbour Time Road and Beaches Link Program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. Do you mind emailing through uh, your opening statement to the Secretariat just to assist with Hansard if you can? Um, yes, we can. We'll kick off with questions from the opposition. Uh, committee members, I propose that we will go through each uh, part of the committee in two rounds um, each. Uh, and so we'll kick off with the first round of opposition questions, which uh, will be about 20 minutes. Mr. Graham. Great. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, officials. Uh, I might turn uh, first just to the overall cost of this project. The committee's weighing up in its recommendations the benefits and the cost of this uh, project, of both these projects. Uh, there's been plenty of information from the government publicly and in the government submission about the benefits, very little detail about the cost. Uh, the, there's been public reports suggesting that the cost of the two projects combined is $14 billion. What is the total cost of the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link project? Is that a question to myself? Yes. Yes, Ms. Trover. Okay, um, as you be aware, um, we've awarded the main contract for the Ringer Freeway Upgrade Project. So the cost of that main contract is now known and confirmed, and that's the $1.18 billion contract that was awarded just this month. Um, we have not uh, commenced the, uh, the main procurement for the Western Harbour Tunnel, um, so therefore the costs associated with that are not confirmed and have not been announced. And uh, we have not yet received investment decision for Beaches Link, um, so the cost details for that project um, similarly have not been uh, announced. Can you understand, Ms. Drover, that it's uh, very difficult for the public, uh, let alone the parliament or this inquiry, to assess this project if the government is being so uh, close with the costs of this project, even a ballpark? Um, it was projected as $14 billion, uh, possibly higher, but $14 billion combined. Is that in the ballpark? Is that accurate, that cost? What the government has confirmed is that in the next four years, in the Ford estimates, we are going to spend $6.3 billion, and there is a breakdown per project for that. So $60 million of that is for uh, further work on Beaches Link. Um, Two hundred and sixty-eight of that is for the Ringer Freeway Upgrade Project, and one hundred and eight million uh, for the Western Harbour Tunnel, and that's just for this year. So there's four hundred and fifty-four million just for 2021-22. But the total cost of the whole project, or either of the elements, is a state secret. That's really the position of the agency or the government. Well, we haven't uh, received investment decision for Beaches Link, so the cost of that component of the program is not confirmed. Um, and similarly, we have not completed the procurement for the balance of the Western Harbour Tunnel program, um, and therefore the costs associated with that, again, have not been confirmed and announced. But the government wouldn't have made an investment decision for the Western Harbour Tunnel without a cost. What was that cost that went in front of the government in order to get this far for the project? Well, the INSW, um, they did release the, the summary final business case. 
Um, that's readily available on their website that was released in May 2020. Um, that included some BCR information, um, but I think you'll also see that it confirmed that when the procurement for the Western Harbour mm -hmm. Tunnel was complete, um, the costs will be confirmed and, and therefore known and could be uh, announced. Yes, yeah, so again, they didn't provide costs in that in that document is what you're confirming. What about cost overruns? The um, government submission to this inquiry in relation to these projects is simply this. There are no cost overruns in a very brief section on costs. Now, Ms. Drover, isn't that ridiculous given your own minister has flagged on November 26, 2019, uh, that the cost of this project could be higher than the estimates of $14 billion. The minister's being more upfront uh, than the own agency's submission is to this, um, to this inquiry. Where are we up to with cost overruns on this project? So although the program, Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link, has been in development for many years, we're just in the very, very early stages of its procurement. So for the Warringah Freeway upgrade, which is the first project to be procured and delivered as part of the program, we've only just this month awarded its main contract. Um, so uh, you would, it would be quite usual not to have cost overruns in the very, very early stages of a project, and particularly when um, a large part of the program hasn't achieved investment decision um, and another large part of the program has not gone through its procurement process. Ms. Drover, can you confirm that uh, given those answers, even though the government's position is this is a state secret, that the total cost of the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches link that was put to Cabinet uh, in the final business case in 2016 was $13.6 billion? I'm not familiar with that number uh, and uh, I'm not sure about your timing either. It's, uh, it's quite usual for INSW to publish its uh, final summary business cases not long after the investment decision, and um, that was published in 2018. Can you confirm that the total cost of the Western Harbour Tunnel component in the final business case that Cabinet saw at the end of 2016 was $6.38 billion? I can't confirm that, and uh, that's also a Cabinet in confidence matter. Can you confirm that the total cost of the Beaches Link component was $7.38 billion? Again, uh, Beaches Link has not uh, received investment decision from government yet, and uh, the final business case um, and what government would see would be a matter for cabinet, cabinet in confidence. Yeah, but those costs, uh, some of those come from uh, leaked cabinet documents, confirm that the Beaches Link component in the final business case was more than half the share. cost. Point of order. Point of order. Well, the questions will take the point of order for Mr. Mallon. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Graham is uh, very good with the flourish, the language, state secrets. and But the uh, witness has said quite clearly on two questions on this matter, that cabinet matters, and he, he's pursuing it, is forcing the same outcome that these are cabinet matters and not matters that she can reveal. And he should change his line of questioning. I don't uphold that point of order. Mr. Graham. Uh, given those costs, uh, can you confirm that the Beaches Link is actually more expensive than the Western Harbour Tunnel part of the project, despite the fact there's less uh, transport on that part of the route? Is that still the case? Um, well, the, the Beaches Link is a longer, there are more lane kilometres of tunnels than the Western Harbour Tunnel. Uh, it also includes a harbour crossing, albeit not as long a harbour crossing as the Western Harbour Tunnel. So you may anticipate that the cost of that project would be uh, would be uh, greater than the Western Harbour Tunnel. The Western Harbour Tunnel um, also includes the Winger Freeway upgrade project as well. That's right. So longer, less traffic, more expensive. Those things almost flow automatically, don't they, in relation to the beaches link? Uh, what I said was there are uh, there is more infrastructure being built as part of the uh, Beaches Link Tunnel than the than Western Harbour Tunnel. What proportion of traffic will the Beaches Link component carry compared to the Western Harbour Tunnel and the West and the Warringah Freeway upgrade? Uh, some of those documents, internal government documents, have it assessed at 25%. Is that accurate? 
Uh, the details of the traffic, the anticipated traffic modelling um, and the demand that was included in both the EISs for the Western Harbour Tunnel Warringa Freeway Upgrade Project and also the Beaches Link um, Project. And they're both being obviously uh, publicly displayed. Um, the Western Harbour Tunnel one has achieved planning approval. Uh, we're waiting for planning approval for Beaches Link. One of the yeah. bits of evidence we've had quite strongly from these local communities is that they're prepared to support the road, but they don't want residential development. They don't want the development that might flow uh, with this. Has Transport for New South Wales, has the former RMS, been working at any stage over the last few years with DPIE, with the Greater Sydney Commission, on land use intensification plans for the Northern Beaches? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, our group is focused on the delivery of this important road infrastructure, not on uh, uh, urban development, etc. Ms. Driver, I might ask you to take that on notice, given your um, uh, the period of time you've been in this role. Could you uh, take on notice whether there's any land use intensification work being done by RMS in relation to the northern beaches? Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly confident that there has been no work undertaken. I think I would that would be brought to my attention if there was, um, but I'm happy to take that on notice and, and see what information can be brought back if there is any information in that regard. But uh, I was with the RMS prior to joining Transport sure. and it's closely associated with this project and was not aware of any work of that nature. You may be able to tell us the uh, benefit cost ratio then for the um, uh, Beaches Link project. Uh, given that oh, well, as I said, that would be included in the final business case, which will be considered by government. Uh, and when investment decision is achieved, um, INSW uh, will publish the final business case summary on their website. Um, but until that time, uh, the BCR is not available. Well, I'll give you the BCR as it went to Cabinet in 2016. Uh, and that was 1.2. Uh, the Western Harbour Tunnel was a very skinny uh, benefit cost ratio, and that's been published. The Beaches Link uh, component had an even narrower um, benefit cost ratio of 1.2, and the wider economic benefits when they were considered also resulted in a BCR of 1.2. That is, they didn't shift the dial at all when it came to this project. Can you confirm those numbers? So I can confirm the BCR for Western Harbour Tunnel, because as you rightly say, that's published um, by the INSW Final Business Case Summary for uh, Beaches Link. I'll reconfirm investment decision hasn't been made and therefore the BCR hasn't been confirmed. I'm not uh, familiar with the numbers you've quoted. It sounds as though perhaps they were from leaked documents, so I, I can't comment on those documents because I'm not familiar with what they are. Uh, regardless, uh, it would be cabinet in confidence if it was a cabinet document. Have you ever seen a project that the government was considering tipping billions of dollars into where there were no wider economic benefits when that analysis was done? I haven't seen it. Is that a common occurrence? Have you ever seen that? Uh, it is uh, it is common for um, when we're assessing BCRs to assess both the transport only benefits and the wider economic ballot benefits. Yes, and and uh, absolutely. Yes, and yeah. normally they increase the BCR as they did for the Western Harbour Tunnel. They don't for the Beaches Link. Have you ever seen that in another project? Well, again, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of. I'm referring to the documents that went to cabinet in 2016. Yes, well, they uh, uh, would be cabinet in confidence, and I'm not across those documents. Um, I wasn't in government in, in 2016. Um, I'm hoping that the agency is familiar with them, though. But what I can say is uh, it is very common in preparing a BCR to look at the transport only benefits and the wider economic benefits. Yes. Could you perhaps take that question on notice then in relation to agency? Uh, can I just clarify what the question is? Um, what other projects that the government is considering investing billions of dollars into experience no change in the BCR uh, when wider economic benefits are are um, considered. Okay, well, I can confirm that it is, uh, in my experience, uh, highly unusual not to have wider economic benefits, but 
I'm just not clear that the point uh, being made uh, because the might move on, Ms. Grover. Can you um, confirm sure. that the cost of integrating the project into existing road networks was estimated at the time at two billion dollars? Uh, for which for the program or which project? for the overall program for the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link. Okay. Well, I can confirm that the cost of integrating uh, both the Western Harbour Tunnel, Warringah Freeway and Beaches Link into the, the wider network um, is included in the cost estimate for the program. Right, thank you. That was my next uh, question. I might turn to the development partner model. Um, this uh, model in the government submission to this committee, uh, it, it's robustly defended. It's now uh, in the months that follow falling apart. Um, what compensation will be paid to those those firms that were part of that development partner process. Okay, if I can just step back a little bit and just explain the development partner process. Um, it was a, a process which was market led. So when the, the process was commenced, we did go out to the market and say, uh, please, would you like the opportunity to tender for services to assist us to procure and then deliver uh, the two proposed contracts for Western Harbour Tunnel. Um, it was a proposed model. There was always um, the uncertainty that we would progress with it and adopt it, um, but we were willing to uh, to work with industry and the market to see what could be could be offered to us. And as I said, it was a market led process. Um, because of that, and in line with the ten point plan commitment to the construction industry, and also in accordance with Treasury's guidelines for bid cost reimbursement. We did offer to reimburse uh, bidders' uh, costs up to 50% of what we estimated their costs would be. And on that basis, we estimated that a cap of up to a million dollars per bidder uh, would be payable. Um, Thank you. And that was, uh, but it was very clear at the outset that we may not proceed and actually. Understood. And what delays will that introduce? That's nearly a year gone out of this project. What delays will that introduce into the project? Uh, it hasn't um, uh, led to any delays because we'd always planned for the scenario where we wouldn't proceed with a development partner. So you may be aware that just in August, uh, we actually issued the EOIs for the two stages, the two packages for the Western Harbour Tunnel. So the scenario where no development partner is pursued was always planned for. What other options were assessed uh, when this project was first looked at to deliver this? You, this development partner model was adopted. What other options were looked at? Okay, like most of the uh, the toll roads to date in Sydney, um, a PPP was looked at but was discounted, um, and it was confirmed that this would be a state led uh, delivery. That meant that the financing and funding would be provided by the state, um, and the contracts for the main works would be between uh, the contractors and the state. Um, so the development partner was just uh, buying in services to assist with resourcing and approaches and methodologies to procure and then administer and, and manage the. So there are two of two of the potential models. What other models were considered? Did the agency consider perhaps securitising the revenue from the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Sydney T Harbour Tunnel? Well, I think if I can just clarify, there's two different concepts. There's how we're going to procure and deliver, um, which was always to be state led. Um, albeit we may have done it with the assistance with a develop, of a development partner versus the funding and financing of the project. Uh, and that uh, remains with the state government. Mm -hmm. So and what is- Did, did the agency that? consider establishing a state-owned corporation in the way it might have done, for example, with the SM3 and WestConnex? Look, a range of options were looked at, um, but that one uh, was not progressed at that time. But it was looked at. Yeah, well, uh, normally we'd provide um, you know, a broad range of analysis to government. Uh, we would look at a number of historic models, uh, including the ones you've mentioned, which have been used previously. Um, but we are going forward with the state-led model and we will manage the procurement and the delivery of Western Harbour Tunnel. When that assessment happened, um, can you confirm that the model that became the development model, what was at the time referred to as the hybrid model, was the least preferred uh, of the options that were examined for delivering these projects? I'm not familiar with that term or that language, um, so I'm sorry I can't comment on that. Well, I'm looking at Cabinet in Confidence documents that indicate the range of delivery models that were considered 
Uh, one of those is the model that became the development partner model. And it's clear from those things that this was the least preferred model when it was assessed by transport. Can you I don't have the benefit of what you have in front of you, uh, but if it is a cabinet and confidence uh, document, I'm not able to comment on it either. Well, these are transport. This is transport information. I don't want you to refer to these documents. I'm referring to these documents. I want you to confirm the development partner model, which has fallen apart, which we're compensating firms for. Was it the least preferred model when assessed by transport? As I said, I'm not, I'm not clear what you're referring to. I don't have those documents in front of me, but if I can just also clarify, the development partner has not fallen apart. Uh, we went through a process where we worked with industry and the market to see what they could offer. We did a value for money assessment and we decided that the best interest of the taxpayer would not be to adopt that model and go forward with it. So transport from New South Wales will procure uh, and manage the delivery of Western Harbour Tunnel themselves. Ms. Draver, I'm, uh, you've talked about the options that were considered. You've talked about some that were put aside, some that were, and one that was adopted, the development partner model. I'm going to give you a final chance to uh, answer the question. Was it uh, the least preferred model in the transport analysis as it came through the agency? And my response is I have no knowledge of, of, of the advice that you're referring to, and therefore I can't comment on it. Can you give us any information about why uh, Infra Infrastructure Australia, which is assessing projects right across the country, uh, when it looks across New South Wales in its most recent assessment of all the projects in September 21, no longer has uh, any reference to the Northern Beaches link on that infrastructure priority list. It was there on the long list previously when it was combined with the Western Harbour Tunnel. It's now not present at all. Uh, why is Infrastructure Australia expressing what could only be interpreted as um, doubts about the urgency of this project? Yeah, look, I can't comment on, on Infrastructure Australia, but what I can say is the program, both Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link, was part of the Future Transport 2056 strategy. Uh, it was also part of the long-term uh, transport strategy, uh, which was published in 2012. And it's also been part of the state infrastructure um, report, which INSW prepares since again 2012. And it's been included as a key priority ever since 2012. Where is the, where is the state infrastructure strategy? It hasn't been produced now for a number of years. Uh, well, Infrastructure New South Wales prepares that strategy. That would be a matter for yeah. them. We'll go to, yeah, sorry, thank you. position time has expired. We'll go to Ms Boyd for 20 minutes. Ms Boyd. Thank you, Chair, um, and uh, thank you, um, Ms. Drover and Mr. Paris, for your time this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to start with um, Ms. Drover at the right at the beginning. Um, you read out an opening statement, and you referred to Sydney having um, population levels that we currently see in cities like uh, like London and New York. Um, Sydney is the most told city in the world, I understand. I don't know if it's still got that title, but it certainly did a couple of months ago. Um, whereas New York and London rely very heavily on public transport. Why is transport for New South Wales so determined to build new toll roads? Okay, as you rightly say, um, this, the projects, the program will be told. Uh, the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link, the Warringah Freeway obviously will not be told. It will remain uh, toll free. Um, we do see this uh, program and its projects as very much part of an integrated transport network. Uh, yes, they are road projects, um, but they provide um, significant benefits, particularly for bus um, transportation. Um, and also active transportation as well for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, it's all about providing that interconnected uh, and integrated transport solution for Sydney. Uh, there are dedicated um, bus infrastructure provided as part of the program. There are also new active transport, pedestrian and cycle um, paths, etc., being delivered. Um, and we must remember that road transport does provide public transport, particularly for buses, etc. There are plenty of new opportunities, particularly with Beaches Link, for new uh, express services too, so that uh, those express services can get into the tunnel quickly and then have a direct connection, particularly to North Sydney, into the CBD, 
uh, through um, uh, towards the inner west and also to, to new destinations like Macquarie Park. So yes, it is a road project, but we see it very much as an integrated um, transport project. There's also um, a clear focus on connection with the new Sydney Metro at North Sydney for both Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link. Um, will a dedicated bus lane be included in both the tunnels? There's not a dedicated bus lane in either of the tunnels, but there is a new southbound dedicated bus lane from Miller Street uh, right through uh, onto the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And that removes the current weaves that people experience on the Warringah Freeway um, currently. Um, that's unsafe and it also um, impacts uh, the reliability and the travel times for buses um, that are coming from the North Shore um, and the Northern Beaches into the Sydney CBD. How can you run an express service, an express bus service, without having a dedicated lane? Uh, express buses um, can use the tunnel along with the other um, traffic, um, commuters, uh, freight, commercial vehicles, etc., and get a very fast connection um, from their origin uh, through to the destination in the tunnel. So, whether that be the inner west or the, or the CBD or but North no Express Lane as such. There's no um, uh, express lane as such, no. We are uh, proposing three lanes in each direction, though, for both Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link. Um, was a, um, a a bus only lane considered as part of this project and then excluded, or has it never been on the table? Uh, not to my knowledge, but I might um, perhaps ask my colleague, Mr. Paris, if you can comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Drover. Um, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Boyd. Um, so, uh, if I can just check the question is, was a bus lane, dedicated bus lane, sorry, um, proposed or considered uh, for the projects? So, um, as, as uh, Ms. Drover said, we've got three lanes in each direction for, uh, for both tunnels. What we have looked at um, is uh, obviously public transport solutions and how we actually um, deliver on those. And that um, uh, consideration, uh, what we did was we actually looked at how the uh, tunnels perform. Um, in, you know, in peak periods, obviously focused on that um, to see whether or not there was a benefit to providing a bus lane when it was re required. Um, our modelling so far uh, that we've done or the modelling that we've done um, to prepare for the projects and the planning process um, says that the tunnels will operate in a free flow state, which means that the buses will actually be moving, um, moving with general traffic. So it's an 80 kilometre an hour zone that should be moving uh, in line with that. Um, that's what our modelling is showing. We do have um, direct connections in it, for example, on Beaches Link, straight in from Waco's Parkway and in from um, Balgala, straight into the tunnels. Um, uh, so that's what our modelling is showing now. Um, if that changes in the future, if there is a large uptick or there is an, you know, a large increase in demand for buses, um, there is an opportunity to put a bus lane in, of course. Um, that's just not what our modelling is showing that we require um, in the early, early years of opening. Okay, so there's, there's not an integrated public transport option within this this tunnel, what you're telling me is that it's a road like any other that a bus can go on. Uh, it's a, um, I mean, it's a road that's got um, opening up new opportunities for buses, um, you know, as far as express buses, uh, you know, the opportunity for a last pickup at Warringah Mall, next drop off at the CBD. I'd say it's probably not just like any other uh, road in that it's a, um, you know, no traffic lights, 80 kilometres an hour, use the Warringah freeway bus lane and you're in the city fairly quickly. I think that's got a fair attraction um, from a public transport perspective. Um, so I think uh, you know I might just might just couch it like that. But um, but as far as providing access, so there is um, bus infrastructure at, you know on Burnt Bridge Creek deviation at Balgala. Um, you know there'll be opportunities for new bus routes to come down Waco's Parkway and enter the tunnel portal, for example. So those are new opportunities um, uh, for buses to use that tunnel. Thank you, um, Ms. Drover. Going back. Um, again, to your opening statement, you talked about um, the road reducing congestion. Um, we've had a number of submissions from community groups and experts who have claimed that, in fact, um, there are large parts of um, impacted areas that will, inc will actually experience increased congestion, um, both during the construction period as well as afterwards. Have you been following those criticisms and have you got a response to them? 
Okay, during construction, there'll obviously be some localised um, impacts of, of the construction activity. Those impacts um, and potential impacts were all assessed as part of the EISs for both projects. Um, we're obviously waiting for the planning conditions for Beaches Link. Um, and remembering that an EIS looks at all the potential impacts um, before they're mitigated by the activities of construction. So we'll be working very closely with our construction contractors to mitigate those in, uh, impacts during construction. In terms of um, operations, um, the a motorway and particularly a tunnel motorway will take um, surface traffic um, off local streets and put it down underground um, and provide that express connectivity. That will change some of the, the travel patterns on the, on the surface, um, but it will uh, obviously substantially take uh, surface traffic down underground. Um, we'll get a slight um, um, uh, uh, moderation of traffic, if you like, on the surface. Um, but all those impacts were absolutely detailed in the environmental impact statements for both projects. Obviously, it's more of a feature of the Beaches Link. Uh, Western Harbour Tunnel um, you know, is, is a different project um, with less uh, impact on the surface traffic given it's uh, an under harbour crossing. I understand that a number of um, submissions have been made uh, in relation to the area around North Sydney. Um, and Berry Street and suggesting that um, although these people are not necessarily opposed to the um, Western Harbour Tunnel, they would they would like to see some changes um, to the um, the entry points in order to reduce the traffic flow. Is there still room for negotiation in relation to the um, to that part of the project? Um, there is the, the North Sydney Integrated Transport uh, Plan. Uh, it's at strategic business case stage at the moment. Um, that is a collaboration between Transport for New South Wales, North Sydney Council and the Greater Sydney Commission. They're looking at um, uh, placemaking opportunities in North Sydney um, and access to integrated transport. Um, we'll need to see where that project uh, goes and whether that has uh, any impact on, um, on the Warringah Freeway, for example. Um, given that in the long term, building more roads creates more traffic. Um, how, when you, your statement about this particular project reducing congestion, what time period would that be limited to before we start to see um, an increase in traffic, which then leads to more congestion and, and desires to build a new road? Okay, again, the EIS did include all that information. Um, the traffic modelling um, was done for various years out. Um, um, perhaps Mr. Paris can give us a little bit more detail on that, what was included in the EIS. Thanks, Mr. Drove, uh, Ms. Drover, excuse me. Um, uh, so the, um, the EIS outlines a number of scenarios, um, as I'm sure you've had a look at, but uh, Ms. Boyd, I'll give you that credit. Um, absolutely. Um, we've we've modelled and presented scenarios there in um, 2027 and 2037. Um, showing the changes uh, in traffic levels in various locations, as you would expect around the network, um, sort of with and without the project, um, and a few sort of versions in between as well um, of different scenarios. So that's presented on that basis. Um, you know, generally there's there's less congestion in um, in most lo locations, um, and I think uh, you know what we've what we've also sort of got to think about as we go into the future is um, you know changes in um, Use so you know obviously we'd like to see mode shift uh, onto the buses um, opportunities for those express buses that we were talking about just a few minutes ago to actually get leveraged um, and and absolutely delivered on. Um, so we haven't actually explicitly modelled, or at least not to my knowledge, modelled a you know a date as such to answer your question as to you know at what point does it change. Um, I think we normally model um, about ten years ahead of uh, ten years sorry after opening. I think would be the term I'm looking for, um, uh, and present those results. Um, okay, just when, <laughs> when you're talking about um, the impacts on congestion versus having the road versus not having uh, this particular road, uh, was there also modelling done as to if you were to have a, you know, another metro service or something else as an alternative to a road? Well, I think um, the assessment that we've done um, to date has been, or the assessment that we've, we've carried out today is really looking at these being um, integrated as part of the part of the network. The challenge, I guess, what we if we step back a little bit, the challenge we're solving is is that 
We've got a range of trips. We've got a lot of trip origins and destinations. They're very diverse. We've got a fairly spread out population in Sydney and Northern Beaches in particular. Um, Northern Beaches, there's sort of a population of 270,000 odd people spread over like a huge area. It's 250 square kilometres, give or take. So it's it's spread out and the nature of the trips is spread out. Um, and so there are some trips that are um, appropriate for public transport. Um, some people getting to work, that's a good idea, or schools. Um, uh, maybe going to the city or something. There, there are some examples like that. Um, there's plenty of other um, trip types, if you like, that aren't serviced by public transport and whether that's freight or online deliveries or possibly taking the kids to weekend sport. So there's a range um, of trips that we are trying to um, address with both of these projects. Uh, and that's where you know we're talking about an integrated transport network. We, we're trying to um, look at the range of trips that customers want to take and provide a solution for them. So public transport, as, as we talked about, without wanting to go back over the old ground or the ground that we just covered, but public transport's been thought about. But um, for Northern Beaches in the, in the sort of middle term, medium term, um, the buses are going to do the heavy lifting, lifting and ferries to an extent. Um, and that's provided by, by this um, and other, as are a number of other trips that are accommodated by having a road-based solution. So you mentioned freight there, um, and as um, Mr. Mallard brilliantly surmised, we you know we don't use metros for um, for freight trips. Um, but is essentially this um, project being built as a freight route primarily? Uh, are you sorry? Can I just clarify? Are you talking about Western Harbour Tunnel or Beaches Link or both? Both. In that instance. Um, so okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, so. It's not primarily for freight. No, it's as I mentioned. There's a range of trips that that customers uh, want to use, uh, you know, need to use to complete their trips, to complete their trips around town, to maintain our economy. Freight is one of those. Moving goods, you know, online deliveries is one of those. But getting to and from school, getting to and from work, tradies moving around to to various locations. There's a range of trips that are out there. Um, freight is one of those. Uh, obviously, um, you know, the the um, connection to provide a freight link will lead to efficiency gains, productivity gains in the economy. Um, the, you know, at the current time, for example, you know, heavy vehicles have to go up and around Monavale Road typically. Um, you know, that's that's an impost uh, and, and a cost, I suppose, that can be can be um, you know made more efficient, uh, as as will the running cost more broadly, um, you know, by use of a project such as this. Um, there's also been some questions um put to previous witnesses in relation to the impact of electric vehicles um, on uh, air pollution in particular. Um, what is the trajectory, if you know, um, for these heavy vehicles, these freight vehicles, um, to become uh, reliant on um, electric engines as opposed to or electric motors as opposed to diesel? Uh, so I'm not able to comment on that. Um, I'm not familiar with with the numbers and the trajectory uh, as to a time frame where, um, you know, if there is a switch coming in diesel and what that what that time frame looks like. I'm just not privy mm. to that information. I'm afraid. Um, mm. What I can say is that um, from the perspective of designing our tunnels and having to think about them and how they work with electric vehicles more broadly, um, uh, and emissions more broadly, I suppose is is um, designing them. Um, so they've got sufficient capacity so that they operate in free flow. That's more efficient for, for um, any engine and having appropriate gradients um, uh, such that, you know, engines don't have to work as hard to get up. So um, get up the hill, for example. So we give consideration to that because we are, um, you know, these are long-term assets, obviously. These are, you know, we talk about them as 100-year assets, um, you know, colloquially perhaps, but they're long-term assets um, whereby um, you know, by then, one would imagine internal combustion engines are long gone. So we want to be able to design them um, to be actually still useful when electric vehicles come to the fore, or hydrogen vehicles. Um, you know, in time, probably automated vehicles. So we want to provide that infrastructure such that it can be readily adopted, perhaps repurposed in due course um, for those sorts of uh, you know transport um, solutions in the future. Do you acknowledge that the um, given COVID? Um, and the instructions uh, for people to, you know, have well ventilated workplaces and, and schools, um, and given the um, range of other 
um, impacts over the last two years from, from bushfires, from a range of other things um, on our air, as well as a, a more, um, I guess, a better understanding of the health impacts of air pollution, particularly on children. Um, can you understand the community's concern in relation to these projects unacceptably increasing air pollution in the area? Well, if I might just address a couple of points in there, I mean, um, firstly, if we need to look at that last statement as to increasing air pollution in the areas, I think we need to, um, you know, if you just come back up a level, the way we design our ventilation systems and, and you know, more broadly for these tunnels is to, um, well, firstly, they're obviously underground, so the, the emissions and things are captured underground in the tunnels. Um, what they, what we do is we capture them before the emissions and the air leaves the tunnel portal. So they're not leaving at ground level. We capture them there and eject them through the ventilation outlets. And um, you know what we what we then need to do is we design those outlets such that there is uh, a negligible impact on air quality. That's been something that's been researched and reviewed um, by uh, the chief scientist and by the um, uh, advisory committee on tunnel air quality, um, who found that. Uh, well designed ventilation systems and ventilation outlets will have negligible impacts on local air quality. Um, so that's how we design our systems. They're not finished until that is the outcome. Plus, we've got some very strict criteria that we need to meet. So I think um, to answer your question, I think I understand why people are concerned, but I also understand that we've done the modelling, we've assessed it and presented it very transparently uh, in a way that's been reviewed by the chief scientist and the chief health officer. Um, and that shows um, not not an increase or not a um, large increase. It's a, it's a negligible impact uh, around those ventilation outlets. I think the other thing maybe to keep in mind is the, the scenario that's presented in the EIS is very conservative. It's what we call a regulatory worst case, which is um, effectively a scenario where each of Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link um, are under breakdown conditions for a year. It sounds ridiculous, but it's a scenario to test whether or not our system is actually capable of, of um, addressing what we need to from a criteria, air, air quality criteria perspective. So why was the Chief Health Officer not asked um, to review the health impacts of the project as a whole? Why was it only around those ventilation stacks? So the, um, the process that was um, set up was for um, some time ago in 2018 was for the ventilation outlets being um, an area of um, I suppose let's call it community concern and focus uh, is, is around those areas. I think it's probably reasonable to um, characterize it as such um, was to focus on those results. And that is a, something that is focused on by the chief scientist and the chief health officer um, separately. But I think if we also remember the EIS does go through a review process by all the government agencies, or at least all relevant government, government agency, um, just, as, just as the community can comment and put a submission in on the environmental impact statement, so can uh, a, a government agency, um, and they do. And uh, ACTAC, the Advisory Committee on Tunnel Air Quality, um, does undertake a review um, of the EIS more broadly, uh, as do other agencies, be that be that fisheries, be that uh, you know council council groups, be that um, you know Office of Environment and Heritage, for example. We'll go and, now to. And if I can just, sorry, sorry. I had to miss the Paris's response. Um, the chief health officer is part of that uh, advisory committee on uh, air quality. It should also be noted that to operate uh, the ventilation systems for all tunnels in Sydney, we need to obtain an environmental uh, protection license from the EPA um, before we operate and then uh, throughout operations. They set the parameters within which we need to operate, but also monitor air quality within the tunnel uh, at the ventilation outlets and in the surrounding uh, environment. Thank you. We'll go to government members. Um, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mellon. And indeed, uh, thank you uh, for coming in today, a busy time for your agencies. Um, we took evidence from the last witnesses around the issue of the license and EPA monitoring and how that works. So we've got that on the record very strongly. So thank you for that. Um, I am interested in the uh, uh, the North Sydney CBD submission to us, and I'm sure it's the council or the resident group um, around the issue of Berry Street and the opportunity to uh, underground that uh, 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 connection from the Pacific Highway through to the um, Warringah Freeway and ultimately the tunnels uh, and the bridge, I guess. Um, having worked in North Sydney, I know what it's like at peak hour up there. 
And we did something similar, and I'll give Labor credit for it. It was a failed project, but uh, nonetheless, the Eastern Distributor with the Woolloomooloo um, uh, outlet, which was to, to, to channel people into forcing them to pay tolls, which was reversed later. But nonetheless, that was uh, added on later on in the project. It wasn't initially going to be there. Is there, is there scope to examine uh, the issue of uh, an improvement to North Sydney CBD with the Berry Street proposal that was put to us? Okay, if I can start and then I might hand over to Mr. Paris for some further details. Um, I'm aware of that proposal um, from North Sydney Council to underground Berry Street. Um, and we did look at that very closely and Mr. Paris can provide us some more detail on that. Uh, it has been determined that will not proceed um, largely based on uh, achievability in terms of construction um, and the cost associated with that, uh, also balanced with the outcomes it delivers for North You're City. saying there's uh, impediments underground to build such infrastructure? Uh, well, there are a range of factors, including the topography and, and the, um, the fall away of the land, for example. Mm. But, but uh, as I said, the integrated um, transport plan for North Sydney still progresses. Okay. And that again has the objective of uh, improving access to integrated transport at North Sydney, okay. but also some place making outcomes. But I might just hand to Mr. Paris if you can give us some further detail on that. And that particularly the analysis that was undertaken on the underground. Yeah, it'd be good for the community to know that it's been looked at um, at a higher level here. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mallard and Ms. Drover. Um, yes, yeah, so as, uh, as Ms. Drover said, we did have a look at that. There are challenges uh, with that, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, I think you know the, the the challenges were really a lot about topography and getting down west. You know, coming if you're coming down, for example, south from say Crow's Nest down the Pacific Highway, you're already coming down quite a steep hill. Mm. So trying to get underground is is uh, you're obviously got to increase that, um, and um, that that becomes a challenge. Uh, plus, underground turning that corner, it's basically a ninety degree turn right now. That doesn't really work too well in the tunnel. Um, you need turning circles. Let's call it or a turn, turning radii um, to get around there. So that sort of led to property impacts, you know, the potential to need to take out high rise buildings um, and okay. if you're familiar with the area. That's that's fairly challenging. Um, so I think we looked at that and we also looked at the extent of that tunnel. Uh, if we were going to do it um, and how we would actually build that, you know, be above the metro line, which is doable. I think, as, as Mr. Driver said, the, the potential at the moment, um, you know, Berry Street does be the motorway system. That's the existing arrangement right. and the scenario that's presented in the EIS you know, relies on that. But the scenario that's being proposed and being worked on with uh, the North Sydney Integrated Transport Program with, with Council would look to change how that, um, you know, change the outcomes, I suppose, change how traffic moves sort of to, from, in and through, I suppose, the North Sydney CBD. Um, and that could lead to um, different different ways for vehicles to move um, around North Sydney. It's reassuring to hear that you've analysed this. I'm not sure that the proponents of the community were aware of that. I can hear, I can um, understand the impediments that you described. I can imagine the steepness to come out of the tunnel and back up into the highway would be a serious issue for trucks like the M5 is. Um, my second uh, line of questions is the, uh, you know, it's a romantic uh, purist vision of having a bus lane in the tunnel. Uh, I, I travel on the M2 uh, and Lanka tunnel regularly. Uh, the uh, T3 lane in the, uh, on the M2 is, you know, we have to have three passengers or drive and two passengers in your car is virtually empty. And the bus lanes going down the M2 out to uh, Blacktown, uh, one bus every now and then, uh, and cars, you know, wishing they could use those lanes. So is that sort of the study, the the evidence you've used to say this is not necessary to dedicate such an important amount of road space in a tunnel, such an a piece of infrastructure, to just buses? You looked at is that is that sort of the information you've, you're working from? I think if I can reiterate Mr. Paris's prior evidence, um, the traffic forecasting at the moment doesn't indicate the necessity to have a dedicated bus lane. But what we're building is capacity, underground capacity, which quite frankly is mode agnostic for the future. Um, the current modelling for the near term suggests um, uh, not the need for a dedicated bus lane, um, but um, you know it's not also ruling it out um, for, for the future. So, so there's capacity for uh, adding lanes in in the future, like you see in West Connects. There's quite a lot of space. Uh, yeah, we're not proposing to add additional lanes to Western Harbour Tunnel Beaches Link, but we okay. are providing capacity uh, which aligns with the the current traffic forecasting uh, and demand forecasting. Therefore, so on another inquiry, as on which I think was um, 
goodness me, so many. Uh, I think it was the um, West Connect inquiry. We had evidence from the RMS that uh, they acknowledged that the design of the M5 tunnel, the original one done by Labor, was a disaster and uh, too steep and badly ventilated and uh, has created so many problems. That's why the new tunnel had to be built. Uh, and also um, uh, the new tunnels, uh, they said, would be higher because, you know, trucks go in with their back up and smash the whole M5 tunnel up. Has that been addressed? These new tunnels uh, address those issues that we've learned from the badly designed M5? Yes, you'll find in all the, uh, the motorway projects that are in delivery, they're all higher, they're all flatter than they have been historically, um, and, and they're wider to, um, to, to accommodate a range of different vehicles and buses, particularly. Okay, that's good. My last question, I have to go to another briefing, of course, but Mr. Faraway has some questions at this time. My last question is, this inquiry is clearly dominated by people who don't support infrastructure like this being built. Uh, the, uh, if there's a recommendation to cancel and not proceed, what would that cost the state to not proceed with these two projects? It's not a scenario that uh, we have modelled. Um, all I can say is that we have now awarded a, the main contract for the Ringer Freeway Upgrade Project. That's a $1.18 billion contract. Uh, we've also got the early works for the Ringer Freeway Project underway. Um, there's obviously material sunk costs in the development of these projects, and uh, in August we started the EOI for both packages of the Western Harbour Tunnel. So it's like uh, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars or more in compensation, uh, if that would occur. Well, as I said, we haven't modelled that scenario. No. Right. And sovereign risk, would that be an issue? Well, I think history says that cancelling infrastructure projects always has sovereign risk issues, but again, it's not something that uh, we've thought uh, very widely about for this project. You won't, this and you won't, need, you won't need to. Uh, Mr. Faraway, are you there? Thanks, Shane. Thanks. I, I have to go. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to, to continue on. Obviously, you, you can't answer that theme about the, with the sunk costs in what it would cost to not proceed with it. Obviously, we've seen examples of significant pieces of infrastructure in other states where they haven't been proceeded with them. Um, but my question revolves around, obviously, the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link is the program, and then you have the three, essentially the three projects, the Ringa Freeway, the, the Tunnel and the Beaches Link. How many jobs in, construct, in the construction phase is involved in the entire program? Okay, uh, we have uh, anticipated that about 15,000 uh, full time equivalent jobs will be generated during construction for the program. So that's the Ring Freeway upgrade, uh, the Western Harbour Tunnel, and the Beaches Link uh, project. I think the other thing to note is the Western Harbour Tunnel is the seventh um, tunnel motorway project being delivered in recent times uh, across Sydney. Um, we're seeing uh, an industry be built around that um, efficiencies, workforces legacy skills and training opportunities coming out of that program. Um, so yeah, it's part of the, uh, the integrated transport plan, which is about completing the motorway network for Sydney. Uh, thank you. Two points that I just wanted um, the Transport for New South Wales to, to expand on for the committee if possible, and that is obviously around the reduction in congestion with these projects and also the safety improvements. Would you be able to expand for the committee uh, obviously, some of the the major points that uh, in around reducing con congestion and, and improving safety that these uh, that this program through the three projects would deliver for for, for Sydney and in particular um, for the interconnectivity um, for this um, road infrastructure. Okay, I might start with Western Harbour Tunnel. Um, as I said earlier, this is the first time in thirty years we're putting an additional harbour crossing in um, for for a road. Um, noting that roads carry both uh, commercial vehicles, freight and commuters and passengers. Um, there aren't many opportunities to increase capacity. Um, for example, it's not really feasible to widen the Sydney Harbour Bridge, uh, nor is it feasible to widen the, the Sydney Harbour Tunnel. So the, the only way we can get additional road capacity across Sydney Harbour um, in those 30 years, and obviously Sydney has changed materially uh, in the last 30 years, there's been uh, change land use north of Sydney on the northern beaches, uh, Chatswood, Macquarie Park, uh, St Leonard's, for example. So, so the only way to get additional road capacity is actually a new crossing. 
um, and that's why we're proposing the Western Harbour Tunnel. Um, it will introduce that new capacity, therefore that will relieve uh, congestion. It also improves uh, travel times, reliability, because that's sometimes more important to people than at the actual travel time, the reliability of how long it will take to get from A to B. And it will also have safety improvements. And that's particularly uh, important for the Ringer Freeway uh, project. That's one of Australia's busiest road corridors. Um, there are uh, thousands of incidents on that corridor every year. Um, there has been some very major incidences which have blocked uh, that corridor and meant that the harbour crossings um, haven't been uh, open and available to, to customers. Um, and given the weave nature uh, of the Ringer Freeway, um, with buses mingling and having to cross multiple lanes, uh, we do have uh, a number of safety um, incidences happening in that corridor. The same with Beaches Link, um, uh, to increase capacity and, and the movement of, of customers through the Northern Beaches. Um, the most efficient way to do that is to, to build that new capacity and to put it underground. Um, that gives you the express connectivity but it also reduces the impact on the surface environment. So I'm just quickly having another look at yours, the, the, the transport for New South Wales submission. So um, once the projects are fully implemented uh, and constructed, you're looking at DY to Sydney Airport, what a saving um, uh, expected to be 56 minutes faster. Is that correct? Uh, that's yes, that's what we've uh, included in the EIS. Right, okay, did you want to expand? Are there any other um, uh, key indicators or uh, around some of the travel times and in particular, perhaps, is there anything, any modeling to show in terms of the improved safety conditions on, the, on this uh, critical and very significant road infrastructure into the future once it's fully implemented? Yeah, there are a range of travel time savings included in the EIS and uh, many of the community updates. Uh, French's Forest to Roseville is a 54 minute uh, forecast travel time saving. Uh, Manly to Macquarie Park, uh, particularly an emerging um, employment centre, uh, is a saving of 32 minutes. And Balgala to the CBD is a 38 uh, minute saving as well. Um, if I can also just raise the, the dedicated southbound uh, bus lane from Miller Street onto the Sydney Harbour Bridge or Sydney Harbour Tunnel, um, that is dedicated to buses only, um, and it stops all those weavings and intermingling of, of normal traffic from the bus travel, um, and that provides safety, uh, but also very, very fast service for bus passengers. Mr Faraway, may I just add to Ms Drover's comments? Um, uh, if that's okay, thank you. I think um, it's it's also important to appreciate um, the nature, I suppose, of the changes that these projects bring. Um, they change how people, uh, you know, move around the network. And I guess if you step back and think, for example, let's just take Beaches Link. It it is a project that connects on the northern beaches, but it does more than just plug in at the Warringah Freeway and provide a bypass to Military Road. It does connect in at the Gore Hill Freeway, so it opens up. Uh, that east-west travel movement, so people that wanted to go, for example, to Macquarie Park from Manly, for example, um, could do that. Um, and that takes pressure off, I suppose, a bunch of rat run routes that currently exist through the North Shore. Um, as we call them, rat runs sort of make some people cringe, but that's the colloquial term. Um, and, um, you know, what we see through Mossman and, and, and Cremorne, for example, people that don't want to use Military Road use Karimba Road, use Karaba Road. Um, people that use the Warringah, uh, Roseville Bridge, I should say, and Warringah Road, they still wind their way down Eastern Valley Way um, to pick up Rook Street and get onto the freeway if they're heading to the city, for example. So there's opportunities really to take a lot of that traffic, that rat run traffic, that through traffic that otherwise doesn't need to be there off those streets and improve the amenity and the outcomes in those areas. So we're seeing some pretty material impacts there, 30, 33 odd percent reductions on Spit Bridge, um, but we're also seeing you know numbers in the order of um, 30, 40 percent reductions on Eastern Valley Way, for example. <laughs> Uh, and seeing reductions on Sydney Harbour Tunnel and Bridge, but, you know, by the same token. My final question before I hand over to my colleague, Mr. Khan, is obviously my, my colleague, Mr. Mallard, mentioned obviously the cost, you know, that the, in not proceeding with the project in terms of sunken costs and what it would actually cost as a monetary amount to government. But has transport modelled 
what the cost would be longer term as legacy infrastructure if the opportunity is missed and, and this infrastructure isn't built. Because you touched on, uh, Ms. Drover, that obviously that interconnectivity and the fact that there are not a lot of options and obviously finding another route uh, in addition to what's there. Like, if we don't proceed with infrastructure, legacy infrastructure like this, what is the opportunity? Does it completely remove the opportunity into the future? Yeah, the cost of congestion on the community uh, and the stock start nature of congestion was included in the EIS. I don't have in front of me those facts and figures, um, but it was quantified the cost of congestion, uh, both in these areas, but also on the, on the broader um, city transport network. I'm not sure whether Mr. Paris could perhaps add to, to that comment. Uh, thanks, Mr. Driver. I, I don't have the numbers to hand, uh, but they were, you know, the, the cost of congestion is something that is, uh, uh, you know, measured and assessed, I suppose, by various agencies from time to time. I, I don't have those figures um, uh, with me. I think your your question or your your comment there, Mr. Faraway, um, uh, which you know, is there an opportunity to to you know come back and do you know redo this infrastructure? I think. Um, you know, there are opportunities to build, as Mr. Over mentioned, we've got an, um, an industry that's trained up and um, in a good position to be able to build these projects. And the project is at an advanced stage of its development life cycle. So um, this is a prime opportunity to uh, move ahead and deliver these projects. Um, that would be probably my, uh, my main comment on that. I'm done if you've got questions, Trev. Yeah, I do. Um, <clears throat> Trevor Khan, how are you? Uh, I, in previous inquiries that have been undertaken by committees, including this committee, uh, there was evidence given with regards to the use of toll roads and more particularly, the distinction was drawn between commuter traffic and commercial traffic. That's, I suppose you could say, heavy vehicle and light commercial traffic. And I, my recollection is that with regards to West Connex, it was estimated that the level of commercial traffic, that's both heavy and light, was in the order of 50% of the vehicles using those roads. Um, I'm wondering if you're able to comment with regards to what I'll describe as essentially the two projects, that's the Western Harbour Tunnel Project and the Beaches Link Project, as to whether there's been any analysis undertaken uh, as to what percentage of commercial traffic is anticipated to use these roads as opposed to commuter traffic? Okay, when we uh, develop a traffic model, um, which uh, assists us to forecast the demand um, for the infrastructure, um, the, the uh, mix of traffic is assessed along with the volumes per mix. So all, all that analysis is undertaken and included in the traffic model. Now, obviously, today I don't have that at hand, um, but you would anticipate, uh, given the location of these projects, um, that there would be a lower uh, freight component than West Connex um, for both the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link. I'm not sure whether Mr. Paris has any uh, information with him today that he could share on the mix between um, uh, light vehicles and heavy vehicles. Thank you, Miss. Sorry, yeah, thank you, Miss Drover. Um, no, I don't have those figures uh, readily available today. Um, I guess my comment would be you know, Western Harbour Tunnel um, would provide, I suppose, better freight connectivity options um, to um, light industrial and commercial areas, areas such as Artarman, uh, for example, um, sort of an area that's and once upon a time been described as the global economic corridor, but I don't think that's necessarily appropriate. There is a, um, a strong sort of commercial industrial um, uh, corridor that runs northwest, I suppose. So there is a good connection there. Beaches Link, um, I would expect to have less as far as, you know, freight just generally. I mean, there is the Brookvale area and there are obviously commercial areas up in that direction uh, and a steady flow of, um, you know, lighter commercial vehicles, you know, be that be that tradies or business to business connections, et cetera. So, but I don't have those figures um, readily to hand. Thank you. Um, we will now go back to the opposition um, and kick off the second round of questions from each part of the committee. I just flagged Ms. Drover and Mr. Paris that 
Unless you have any objections, I'm hoping to finish the hearing sometime between 4.40 and 4.45, just to permit um, some of that time. Is that is that okay? Is there any objections to that? Uh, why? Well, we started five minutes late, Trevor. Uh, look, it's not. I'm not too stressed. If, if, you, if the committee is insisting that we close at 4.30, we will. But it's just an additional I, 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 eight minutes will. It just seems to me we seem to drift out on these things all the time. I'm, I'm just wondering at the justification for the extension. Well, look, again, I'm just putting it to the witnesses. If they have an objection, um, we will stick with the original timetable. Uh, we have no objection. Um, we'll be guided by the committee. Thank you, Ms. Drummer. Um, I just wanted to just pick up on some of the questions um, uh, that my colleague, Mr. Graham, was asking about the development model, partner model. Um, when did transport decide to abandon that method of procurement? Uh, we, we undertook a rigorous uh, assessment process of the tenders that we received from the three parties. Um, that process uh, had an independent chair um, oversighting uh, the tender evaluation panel. There was also a tender review panel. Um, when the evaluation was complete um, and we could assess the value for money being offered by the three parties, uh, it was assessed that uh, it wasn't value for money and therefore we didn't proceed. And when was that, Ms. Trevor? Uh, well, that assessment was made where we evaluated the three tenders that were submitted. And when was that? Uh, it was um, several months ago. I, I haven't got the exact timing with me. Um, but well, we, I, I know we're in feedback sessions at the moment with the three parties, so it, it must have been you know, a couple of months ago. Who made the decision to abandon the development partner model? Uh, the tender evaluation panel made a recommendation to the tender review panel, um, and that recommendation was not to proceed with any of the three bidders' offers and for transport to proceed to uh, themselves procure and deliver both packages for Western Harbour Tunnel. So was that decision made by the tender review panel or, or the tender evaluation panel? There's two of them, is there? Uh, the tender evaluation panel makes a recommendation yep. to the review panel. Um, and that ultimately went up to the steering committee for Western Harbour Tunnel. Um, on that steering committee sits representatives for, from Transport for New South Wales and also Treasury. And so that committee abandoned the development partner model? No, as I said earlier, the recommendation came from those assessing the three tenders, uh, including the independent chair, who is not from Transport nor Treasury. Their strong recommendation was not to proceed with any of the three tenders. Sure. Was that decision given concurrence by the minister or the government? Uh, the minister was not part of the evaluation process. Was it required to go to cabinet to abandon that decision, or was that a decision that you could make within your own, or the transport could make within its authority, as the way you described? Uh, it it was a decision, as my uh, recollection of the steering committee, to proceed on. Mr. Trevor, I will press you again. Do you know when? What month we're talking about, or can you take it on notice as to when you made the decision to abandon them? Yes, it was about the middle of this year, 2021. So March, April? I think it was a little later than that, um, but I can take on notice the exact date when uh, the, the recommendation was endorsed by the steering committee. When were the consortiums told? Uh, after that decision was made, uh, we advised uh, the, three cons the three consortia. Did you give them any prior indication that that was being considered as an option? Uh, sorry, what was being considered as an option the that, that we may not? Model. Yes. Yeah, from the outset, we always said it was proposed model. Uh, we went out to market to see what market could offer in terms of resourcing approaches, methodology and risk allocation. Um, so they were always aware that we may not proceed with the development uh, partner model which is one of the rationales for um, offering bid cost reimbursement on the way through. So uh, various form members of those, well, people participating in that bid process from the perspective of the consortiums have gone public with their concerns and basically implied that transport ambushed them and they didn't see it coming. Did you ambush these consortiums or did you give them enough adequate warning that this was being considered? As I said, they, they were very. We were very clear from the outset that this was a process that would be market led, um, but there was definitely always a scenario where we would not proceed with the development partner. It was a function of the offers that we were receiving from the private sector. My last question on this, before I ask to Mr. Graham, um, 
Mr. Mallard raised the concept of sovereign risk, which is an, another fancy way of saying bad reputation by the New South Wales government in the market. Haven't you uh, materially damaged the New South Wales government's reputation in the construction market by uh, the choice to abandon this development partner model with what seems to be no notice to these particular contractors? I think we have to be clear what the development partner model was actually seeking to achieve. We were looking to procure resources to run a procurement process uh, and then uh, seeking resources to manage and administer two construction contracts for the Western Harbour Tunnel. There was no financing component with the development partner, nor was there a funding component. Uh, and uh, and they, the contracts remained between transport and the construction contractors in all scenarios, whether there was a development partner or not. So it perhaps is uh, could be characterised as just the outsourcing of procurement processes and then the administration of two construction contracts. That's in essence what the development partner was seeking uh, to to buy services for. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, Chair. And Ms. Trover, I might um, continue questions to you. I'll turn now to the uh, toll rates, which will apply to what will be uh, Sydney's latest toll project, uh, Sydney's latest toll road. Uh, some of this material has been revealed publicly before, so I might put that to you um, first altogether. It was revealed that these would be flat rates, not distance-based charges, that they'd be each way uh, on each of these roads, uh, that is the Western Harbour Tunnel and the Beaches Link. Uh, also that they would uh, mean a move to each way tolling on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Sydney Harbour Tunnel. The toll rates uh, for those when this was revealed publicly uh, were $3 each way for the Western Harbour Tunnel, for the Sydney Harbour Tunnel and the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and $5 each way for the Beaches Link. These are in $2016. And finally, that uh, heavy vehicles would be charged three times the amount of cars. Uh, now, that's been publicly reported by that Herald some years back. It's consistent with the information I've seen uh, about what was put to Cabinet, about the toll rates that it apply when this final take business case for both projects were considered. I'll take a point of order. Would you like? I'll take a point of order. It's unfair to have bundled up for any witness the number of propositions that Mr. Graham has sought to make up combined with his common practice of adding in a variety of inflammatory commentary. I really would ask that he simply ask a question and give the witness an opportunity to answer each part of it. Uh, I'm happy I'm, to respond to your question. I think I'm going to get the same answer to each bit. That's that, I was trying to save us all time. <laughs> Look, when uh, when the New South Wales government announced the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link program in 2017, uh, they were open and transparent that both roads would be tolled. Uh, as I said earlier, not the Warringah Freeway upgrade, uh, though that remains toll free. Um, the decisions on the level of tolling has not been made by government. Um, so the information that you refer to, uh, I'm not across, um, and, uh, and when the government has made a decision on the tolling regime, it will publicly announce it. Thank you for that answer. And uh, so accepting that and not asking you to comment on the information that the Herald has published about what went to Cabinet or what I've, uh, what I have seen about the tolling proposals. Uh, could you answer in general terms? Um, if there was a flat rate toll of three dollars uh, put on uh, trips on the bridge, can you confirm that it actually be an end to time of day tolling on the bridge? That necessarily well, flows, there, doesn't it? There's been no decision on the tolling regime for either the Western Harbour Tunnel or Beaches Link. So, I'm not asking you if there's a decision, Ms. Grover. You've been very clear on that. I'm saying if a toll, I'm asking you to answer in general terms, was put on the Harbour Bridge of $3, a flat toll, that'd be the end of time of day tolling on the bridge. Uh, it's not a scenario I'm familiar with. So you're saying there's, if it was a $3 flat toll, there, there is currently a, a flat toll on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, albeit there is time of day tolling. 
Yes. Yeah, and so that time state time a... kicks in. A... Yeah. That's right. So, so what so. I can say is um, flat tolls, not distance-based tolls, are a common feature of, of uh, motorways and crossings where there, are, where there is only one entry and exit point. Uh, so, yeah. for example, the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, obviously, you get in one end and you come out the other. There are no on and off ramps uh, on the way through. Um, so you could apply a, a flat toll, but as I said, yeah. there's no decision by government on the tolling regimes for Western Harbour Tunnel or Beaches Link. Yeah. So, so again, in general terms, without asking about the government decision, if that uh, model, which has been out there in the public discussion, a flat toll of three dollars as you travelled on the Sydney Harbour Bridge was applied, can you confirm it would be lower than the current peak toll of four dollars? as you can cross the Harbour Bridge at the moment? Well, I think given government has a made decision on the tolling regime yet, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on, on a number right, of- You're not disagreeing that the peak toll is $4 on the Harbour Bridge, are you? I'll take the point of order. I'll take the point of order. The point of order relates to the uh, procedural fairness resolution that was adopted and indeed it was adopted unanimously by all parties. I think it is resolution 10 says that public officials will not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy. Now, there's been three attempts at least so far by Mr. Graham on this occasion to do precisely that. It's pretty clear by the resolution that he is outside the terms of the resolution adopted not only by the Privileges Committee, but also by the Parliament. Well, it's good to have you back with us, Mr Khan, today. Indeed, can, indeed. I, can I just say, uh, on the point of order, uh, I didn't characterise Mr Graham's question as an attempt to assert an opinion. I characterise it more as an attempt to access some expertise. But nevertheless, I'm sure Mr Graham uh, will wisely spend his remaining time. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you also confirm that uh, in addition to tolls uh, under that proposal falling on the Harbour Bridge, that will be on top of the fact that the government over the last 10 years has never raised the Sydney Harbour toll, despite it be, being required to review it annually. Look, as I said earlier, a decision on the tolling regime for Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link has not been made by government. Um, I'm actually not across what changes to the tolling regimes on the other uh, crossings have been made in, in recent years. Um, today's inquiry, as I understood it, was about the Western Harbour Tunnel and Beaches Link. I might um, ask one, I think, final question on the um, tolling regime which is just on the escalators. Again, I won't ask you to comment on the um, information that's uh, there, but uh, in the information I've seen, each of the options uh, contains a 4% escalator. In the Herald analysis, um, some of the options contain that 4% escalator. My question to you, Ms. Drover, is this. Have we learnt the lesson of putting up these toll costs by 4% a year when we now know that wages are lower than that, inflation's lower than that, uh, the interest, interest rates are lower than that. What assurance can you give the public that we're not about to make the same mistake? Uh, will transport advise against those 4% toll escalators? Uh, all decisions around tolling uh, regimes and policy is a decision for the New South Wales government. And I don't think it'd be prudent for me to comment on information published in the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, finally, I um, might ask this and then hand to my colleague. Um, just returning to the Beaches Link proposals, we're preparing to make recommendations as the committee. Um, you've agreed this is more costly than the Western Harbour Tunnel, and that just makes sense looking at the geography. It necessarily has less traffic. It's not on the September 21 Infrastructure Australia priority list. The evidence we've had from the uh, councils there, the communities there, is they'd like the road, but only if it means no more residential development. It's been separated from the Western Harbour Tunnel and the Warringah Freeway upgrade. 
part of the project and delayed. Uh, in your view, uh, will this project ever proceed? And if so, when will it start? Okay, there's a number of items in that question. If I might just um, start by reiterating my uh, prior evidence. What I said is there are more lane kilometres for the Beaches Link uh, project than there is for the Western Harbour Tunnel. Um, uh, I have not uh, given evidence on the cost of Beaches Link because the investment decision for that project has not been made yet, and therefore the cost of that project is not confirmed. Um, the other point you made, I think, was about. Sorry, um, there are there are two other matters that you raised yeah. with me. The question, Miss Driver, was when will the project start? Uh, look, um, as is of course uh, processed with the INSW assurance process, we need to uh, receive investment decision before we can proceed. We are also awaiting the planning approval. Um, so the exhibition for the uh, Beaches Link project finished in March 2021. Um, next month, October, we are hoping to submit our preferred infrastructure report, which is our response to all the community feedback and all the other stakeholder feedback we've had for the EIS. That will go back to DEPI, Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Uh, they will then um, assess the, the PIR and all that response from the community and stakeholders, and they will um, uh, ideally and hopefully give us planning approval um, sometime early next year. Um, we would not be in a position to procure a project uh, without having a planning approval in place. As you've seen in our um, budget for this year, uh, we continue to spend uh, $60 million on Beaches Link. That allows us to complete our packaging and procurement strategy for Beaches Link. It's only been uh, a couple of months since we completed our engagement with industry. Um, and we had a very interactive uh, and rigorous process with industry to look at how we would package up the works for Beaches Link. Um, and the other work that continues is obviously further site investigations and analysis. We want to make Strava. sure that we're ready to deliver Beaches Link when we get that investment decision. Ms. Strober, is it fair to say that um, the government cannot make a final investment decision until those processes you just described are completed? Uh, no, investment decisions can be made before planning uh, approvals are granted. Sure. So it's, can we imply that it's been the discretionary choice of the government not to make the final investment decision, given that um, they haven't yet? Oh, an investment decision is the, uh, is the purview and responsibility of the New South Wales government. Can I just ask about the Western Harbour Tunnel? When will it be open to motorists? Uh, well, we need to first procure it. Um, so, as I said, in August, the end of August, we issued the two EI, EOIs for both packages of the Western Hub Tunnel. Um, after the EOI, we'll do a shortlisting process, and then we're anticipating starting the tendering process uh, early next year. Um, and I think in line with the advice um, that's in the INSW final business case summary, it's, uh, it's roughly a five-year build. Um, but that will be confirmed when we procure and we get uh, the firm offers back from our construction partners in the tendering process. So on that timetable, uh, we're looking at it opening to motorists circa 27, 28. Well, uh, we still need to go through the procurement process. Uh, yes, there are two you. packages, and we need to look at the interfaces between those two packages. Um, and what industry can offer us in terms of optimising that interface and and the um, the Mr. Interface. Robert, it's not a it's not a particularly difficult or for that matter tricky question, right? When can motorists expect to use this piece of infrastructure? Is, are we saying it's twenty seven twenty eight at the earliest, with a chance that it could be later? Is that fair? Well, we need to award the contracts, which we're aiming to do uh, by next year, the end of twenty two, and then we're anticipating it's about a five year build. So the last available public information we had said that it would open in 25, 26. Uh, has there been a slippage in the timetable of at least a year? Uh, what we have done um, since the project was first uh, considered is that we've moved away from the PPP model and more importantly, the single package model. And that's very much in response to market dynamics. Uh, the market has quite clearly told us that they want it uh, procured as two packages um, because we need to do one and then come back and, and finish it with the other. 
um, that uh, has added some time um, to the delivery program. Sure. And look, Mr. Robert, if that is the rationale for the reasons why it's now running at least another two years after the original timetable, so be it. But are you saying that the reason why this is now going to take two years longer was because it would have been too expensive to procure according to the original procurement model? Uh, no, what I'm saying is that we, we've done the necessary work. Uh, we've had at least three rounds of intensive engagement with industry to, to uh, share our reference design for the project, to really workshop what the key delivery risks are and how they would be best managed and mitigated and shared. Um, and the best way to package up the work to, to manage and mitigate those risks and the, the best programming approach. So we put the time into doing that with industry and in parallel to that, we've also been getting on and doing further site investigations. Uh, a project of this scale and complexity, we're not gonna rush into it. We're gonna make sure Mr. we've done the work. Mr. Uh, I've got one more time for the last question here. I've got time, my good chair. But the last question is this, is in terms of the funding strategy for the Western Harbour Tunnel, is transport for New South Wales either directly or jointly with Treasury considering a model that would see the Western Harbour Tunnel privatised after completion? Are you currently uh, clearly in work on that? Uh, look, we're currently focused on procuring the, the two packages um, for Western Harbour Tunnel. Uh, we've got the EOI out. Um, and as I said, we're, we're focused on uh, getting those in, doing the short listing and getting on with the procurement of those. Um, the other thing we've also done is um, we are looking to procure an asset manager who will assist us in that procurement um, to provide advice about the operations and maintenance of, of the project when finished. Um, so that's our focus at the moment. Okay, an asset manager. We'll go to Ms. Boyd. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could um, start with you again, Ms. Drover. Um, I asked a question in the last session around the potential conflict of interest involving the Jacobs group. So I understand that um, Jacobs completed the EIS technical review, um, but are also one of the contractors who are part of the Sydney Program Alliance that were awarded the early works around Moringa freeway upgrade. Um, and now they will also be doing some detailed site investigations and testing in relation to the project. Is that a conflict of interest? Okay, I'll just clarify. Um, Jacobs were the environmental advisor for both the Western Harbour Tunnel and the Beaches Link EISs. So they assisted RMS and now Transport to prepare those EISs. Um, they obviously then went to the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment uh, to give the planning approval. So they prepared the EIS, DPI uh, gives the planning consent. Now post uh, planning approval for Western Harbour Tunnel, they are part of the Sydney Project Alliance, as you rightly say. That is an alliance um, which has three main participants, uh, Transport for New South Wales, the John Holland Organisation and Jacobs. Um, they are predominantly doing works uh, on uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge, um, and they are also assisting us with the services and utility relocations, which are the early works for the Ringer uh, Freeway Upgrade project. They're quite different teams at Jacobs, so their environmental team would have uh, prepared the EIS. Um, and now another part of uh, Jacobs, the, uh, the consulting engineering part, if you like, um, they're assisting John Holland to manage the service and utility relocations. Um, so th there's not a, a conflict given their original work was pre-planning uh, approval and their current engagement is different in nature and it's also post the planning approval. They're not uh, checking their own work if, if you like. Um, there is also a probity advisor um, who was absolutely involved for all the procurement for the Ringer Freeway upgrade project, both the early works package and uh, the main contract, which has just been awarded. Is it standard practice for an entity that is likely to be granted some form of contract um, in relation to a project if it goes ahead, being treated as a independent um, entity for the purposes of producing an EIS for that project? 
Um, well, Jacobs would have been engaged many years ago uh, when they prepared the EISs. Um, independent of that, they were also part of that Sydney Project Alliance. Um, I, I can't recollect exactly when that alliance was established, but it's only in more recent times that uh, that alliance has uh, been issued with a variation to also assist with the services and utility relocations for the Ringa Freewa upgrade project. Um, it's a very small amount of work. It is only um, limited to services relocations. Um, they are already in that geography. Um, they know the stakeholders in that environment. Um, they're, they're already established and mobilised. Um, so that's why it was thought that we could vary that existing engagement with the Alliance to do the early works, which is the service utility relocations for the Winger Freeway upgrade. Um, mm -hmm. th there was no uh, perceived or actual conflict uh, identified. We heard in the first couple of hearings a lot of concern that the EIS had not been um, produced particularly robustly uh, with a lot of discussions about um, the te various testings, you know, not being done at appropriate times and um, perhaps mitigation um, measures being put in place being inadequate. There was a lot of criticisms of that EIS. Do you think um, that it's reasonable for the community to to feel a lack of confidence in that EIS process, given that the people who wrote it are now financially benefiting from the project? Look, if perhaps if I can just um, step back and explain the EIS process. Um, the Secretary for the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment sets out what is called the SEERS, the Secretary's Environmental Requirements that have to be met. So they're the criteria with which we need to uh, prepare our EIS. We prepare it most often with an external advisor. It is then uh, put on public exhibition. The community and stakeholders put on comment, as you'll be aware, and then it's DPI that gives us planning approval or not. That's not the end of the process. If you like, it's really just the start because then to actually start any works, we need to prepare um, the CEMP, the Construction Environmental Management Plan. And that's um, the contractor's response to how they'll actually comply with the planning conditions and how they will mitigate any of the potential impacts that arise. Uh, and it's directly correlated with their actual uh, reference design, not their reference design, their final design. And it also uh, takes into consideration and correlates to their actual methodologies. So that's the plan, the overriding construction management plan which sets out how they're actually going to build the project and, and when they encounter impacts, how they will manage them, how they will mitigate them and the extent of monitoring, et cetera, that will be undertaken. How um, much of that plan relies on the EIS information? Uh, what it does, it looks to the planning conditions, which are set by DPI, the Department of Planning, and it then looks at their actual proposed design and their actual methodology, and it comes up with a plan of how they're actually going to deliver the project. That CEMP also needs to be review, reviewed and approved, and that's done by the Department of Planning, uh, Industry and Engagement, uh, Industry and uh, Environment. It's also uh, reviewed by the EPA, and importantly, it's also reviewed and accepted by an independent environmental uh, representative. Um, over and above that, the construction contractor also needs to work within the bounds of the environmental protection license, which is issued by the EPA. And that, similar to the conditions of approval, if you like, sets out the limits within which they can operate, the extent of monitoring that's required, and, uh, and what they can and can't do. Can I but ask, that, sorry, yeah. just my question was, how much of that is reliant on the EIS. I take it no one goes back and, and redoes the tens of thousands of pages of EIS, but instead these plans are built upon the information provided in the EIS. Is that correct? The EIS outlines all the potential impacts that the project might generate, and that's based on a reference design. Um, and then the planning conditions set by DPI look at those impacts and say, if those impacts do eventuate, materialise, how would you manage them? And, and what are the conditions that have to be complied with? 
It's the CEMP which actually says what has to be done, what can and can't be done, and how it will be done to ensure that the contractor complies with the planning approval and if, its conditions. But if the EIS underestimates a risk or fails to recognise a risk that needs to be mitigated, that's not going to be picked up in the CMMP, is it? Well, uh, it is because the CEMP has below it a whole range of other plans, everything from the soil erosion plan, the, the dredging plan, uh, the noise attenuation plan, stormwater management plans, and all of these plans look to the planning uh, conditions, but it also says how the contract will go about its works. It also refers to other standards and other um, specifications and procedures that it must comply with. There is also a plan for unexpected fines, for example, which I think goes to your point. If there is something that arises that's an impact on the community or the environment, which wasn't contemplated in the EIS, there is still a strategy for how it must be managed, monitored and mitigated. So that is addressed in the CEMP. And I think the just other thing to, that's valid- Sorry, just to clarify, I understand that there are layers of protections that are put on top. What I'm asking about though, is if that EIS has got things wrong, at what point does that get picked up unless the actual um, person who is doing the work comes and tells you about it? I think there's, there's multiple layers to it. Um, obviously, the contractors won't want to breach any uh, legislation, EPA parameters, etc. There is a whole raft of on-site supervision as well. Um, so not only the contractor supervision, they've got reputation risk to, to protect. Transport has their own supervision, as does DPI, the EPA. There are a huge variety of other um, independent parties. For example, the dredging management plan needs to be reviewed and approved by not only the EPA, but also the Department of Fisheries. Um, and that plan, let's just clarify, that plan will be based on what is seen in the EIS. Is that right? No, it's based on what the contractor anticipates it, uh, the, the impacts of its work will be. It, it also reflects the conditions of approval uh, and it reflects a whole lot of other, as I said, specifications, policies, procedures that they may need to comply with on the way the through. The conditions of approval on... are based on the EAS, correct? They are, yes. Right. I think, sorry, I think we're going around in circles. Um, thank you for those answers. Um, you talked a moment ago about the reputational risk for the for the contractors, etc. Um, we heard on day two of our inquiry um, some evidence from individuals who've been impacted by West Connects, um, and particularly the cumulative impacts that they felt um, with uh, noise and vibration and a bunch of other things. Um, they also talked about how difficult it was for them to enforce um, requirements that have been placed on those contractors. My question to you is what has been learnt so far from that experience on West Connects and how will this be different for impacted residents? Okay, look, a lot obviously has been learnt. I think I said earlier, Western Harbour Tunnel will be the seventh motorway tunnel that will be delivered in recent times. Beaches Link will be the eighth. Um, I think the other thing to note is the EIS for Western Harbour Tunnel uh, very uh, specifically did look at the community uh, cumulative impacts of construction, particularly in that uh, Roselle Balmain precinct. Uh, we're very cognizant that uh, the M4 M5 link um, is being constructed, as is the Roselle interchange. Um, there is also the Metro project, which is now in that precinct as well. So it's an issue that we're very alive to and we're very concerned about, which is why the cumulative impacts were modelled in and assessed as part of that EIS. Um, because we're, we're, we're cognizant of the issue and, and we do want to sort of, to the extent that we can mitigate construction fatigue in that precinct, we have got a range of, of forums um, going. Uh, for example, there's one with Metro so that we coordinate our works um, and, and manage them in an integrated fashion. Um, particularly around respite periods, um, et cetera. But a lot of the planning conditions for Western Harbour Tunnel actually acknowledge those cumulative impacts of construction in that precinct. And that has led to um, many of the conditions of approval related to noise attenuation, uh, respite periods, um, the extent of, of night works, 
um, and, and generally the extent of work that can be done at any one uh, point in time. So it, it's, a, it's a real issue. It's an issue we're, we're very alive to and we're working very hard with that community and with Metro and with the Rosal Interchange particularly um, so that we can, to the extent possible, mitigate those impacts. Will you be putting into new contracts um, with these contractors um, a provision that says that they can't try and gag residents from speaking to the media? I'm sure you're aware of the, the um, uh, what are they called, uh, noise cancelling headphone issue. Um, can we have an assurance that won't happen again? Look, what I, what I can say on that issue is that um, uh, that deed was used, uh, I know this is beyond the, the, the remit of this inquiry, but I'll, but I'll comment on it otherwise. Uh, otherwise. Um, that deed has been used many, many times by that particular contractor. Um, there was one instance where there was pushback, and I understand the contractor has now modified uh, the language and the wording in that deed to address that issue. Um, the, the provisions of noise cancelling headphones um, are, are a method that many in the community uh, welcome and, and have adopted and taken up. Um, they're over and above what, what is actually required uh, and hence that, that deed that's in place between the community and that contractor. But as I said, I, I understand uh, they've actually modified the wording to, to take on board that community feedback. Thank you. Mr. Um, Boyd, may I, may, may, may I just add a comment uh, to your earlier question? Please do. Thank you. Um, uh, I just, it was, it was your earlier comment about, um, you know, things that we've, things that we've taken on board uh, as to how we're going to manage our impacts uh, in the community. I think um, it is worth, I think, um, just reflecting on the nature of the works on the Warringah Freeway, for example, um, that is busy um, surface surface road, and that will sort of obviously entail um, an amount of night works. Just by definition, we obviously need to strike a balance between keeping the network moving and doing our work. Um, and we've been very alive to that. Um, and we do have, as Mr. Trover mentioned, some um, conditions on um, the, the nature and the um, extent of that work. When how many can be done at night, respite periods, um, and the like. I think. Um, the point that I was uh, wanting to make um, was that we recognised that quite early and we actually got on with um, uh, putting together what is probably the largest um, at property acoustic treatment um, program. Uh, our, our EIS identified around about 2,000 or just under 2,000 properties that may be eligible for noise treatments. That number's now actually gone up as we've done more work. Um, it's about 2,200, give or take. Don't quote me on the exact figure, but that is something that we've been trying to get ahead of. Um, so that we can actually treat those properties uh, as early as possible. Um, we've contacted around about 90% um, of those uh, of those people already, so that's well ahead of construction. So I think, um, you know, what we, what we I suppose, without sort of wanting to waffle on too much, I guess we're acknowledging that there is going to be a large impact, and we've been embarking on that journey for probably three years to try and get ahead of that, um, uh, such that, you know, our impact will be... Um, hopefully more manageable for those people that do happen to be, you know, in the immediate vicinity of the Warringah Freeway. Thank you. That is good to hear. Um, Ms. Drover, probably one for you. Um, I just wanted to talk about the numbers of properties that will need to be acquired by Transport for New South Wales in relation to both projects. Do you have an estimate um, for how many homes will need to be acquired? Okay, for the combined Western Harbour Tunnel and Warringah Freeway upgrade project, uh, there are 20, uh, sorry, there are 17 residential properties that are required to be are required to be acquired. So was that 17 or 17? 17, one seven. Yeah. And we have actually completed all the acquisitions for those 17. So that's for the uh, Warringah Freeway and the Western Harbour Tunnel. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, and how about the um, the sort of substratum acquisition? Uh, the substratum is done when we've got the detailed uh, design from the contractor. Now, obviously, we haven't procured the Western Harbour Tunnel yet, um, so we don't know exactly where the substratum is. We only acquire what we actually need. So we wait till we've got the very detailed design, which confirms exactly what substratum is required. And then we acquire um, that substratum, substratum, the actual. Obviously, surface properties um, are more uh, easily able to be assessed um, prior to construction. Do you have so obviously no substratum being acquired for the Warringah Freeway upgrade? 
Thank you. Do you have an estimate for what will be required for both those projects in terms of substratum acquisition, number of people? I don't have an involved? estimate. Uh, no, I don't have an estimate available. Was there an estimate included in the um, overall cost of the project, the estimated cost of the project? Uh, well, uh, sub, uh, no compensation is paid for substratum acquisition, so uh, there yes. wouldn't have been a cost associated with that. And no compensation paid to the impacted families? Uh, compensation is paid where there is impact uh, to a property, um, given the substratum is at depth. Um, uh, it's been assessed as having uh, no impact um, and therefore compensation is not paid, and that's in accordance with the Just Terms Act. Okay, thank you. Um, just check, I might pass back to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we will. Uh, government members, I understand, have waived their final 20 minutes. Um, and therefore, I think we will close the hearing at 4.30, uh, the original scheduled time. So the witnesses are, will, will be excused at that point. Um, that was then, my proposition, yes. So uh, that was Mr. Carr's proposition. No, so everyone convinced the second by me way strongly, out of strongly. So there's about seven more minutes left, which will I guess be pulled between the opposition and the crossbench. If there's any particularly strong questions there. Um I just might just complete that round of questioning that Miss um, Boyd was asking. Miss Driver, do you have the number of business acquisitions that are required as part of the Western Harbour Tunnel? We gave us the residential numbers. What do we have the business numbers? Uh, there are four non-residential properties that are proposed to be acquired for Western Harbour Tunnel and the Warringah Freeway Upgrade Project, and I understand we've acquired one out of those four to date. Thank you. And do you have any estimates of both residential and business for the Northern Beaches Link component of the project? Uh, yes, I do. These were included in the EIS. Um, 35 residential properties for Beaches Link and uh, 12 non-residential properties for Beaches Link. And have you started... Yeah, Acquisition process with those 35 and those 12? For Beaches Link? Yes. Um, when the project was announced, uh, even at the concept design stage, uh, where it would, there was a high certainty um, that properties would be required for the project, property owners were given the option whether they would like us to acquire their properties by negotiation. Um, some of those properties have been acquired, some of that were on a hardship basis. Um, my understanding is that we've issued opening letters for all the residential properties for uh, Beaches Link, but we haven't started the compulsory acquisition process yet. Thank you, Ms. Trevor. Any additional detail you wish to provide on notice, you're welcome to on that, um, that as well. Can I just have a couple of questions before I pass to my colleague? Just on the funding model aspect of this, uh, my colleague earlier on did ask you about whether or not you were considering the securitisation of the Harbour Bridge. Uh, uh, as a way in which to and stapling it to this project. Is that work that is being undertaken by transport or treasury to the best of your knowledge? Oh, look, I think in the life of this project, there's been a, a broad range of analysis that's been undertaken, um, probably provided to government over time. Um, any decision around that would, would be that decision of government and policy. Of course, and look, I'm not, I do agree that the funding model is a question for government, but I'm asking more from the public service perspective. Um, am I right to imply from that answer that this has been an option that has been modelled by the Transport Department or the Treasury? Oh, well, well securitisation and, and that sort of activity is uh, is led by Treasury, so that would be a question for Treasury. Um, but all I can say is obviously a project of, of this maturity, um, lots of different options would have been looked at um, and that advice provided to government. Government will need to make a decision on on how it goes forward if it did want to take up any of those options. Has Transport ever provided advice to the government that it should include the Harbour Tunnel in with this project, and when its concession expires, and staple it to this project for the purposes of then selling onwards to the private sector? Look, I'm not aware of, of that advice. Uh, what I can say though is because um, I mentioned that we were going out. Uh, uh, for an asset manager. Uh, just to clarify what an asset manager is, um, they would provide operational uh, services and maintenance services. Um, we are going to market to see whether we can uh, get an ONM provider to, uh, to take over the ONM services for the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, uh, given that concession expires at the end of next year. 
Um, and we're also seeing whether at that same time, they would also like to, uh, to bid for the O&M services for the completed Western Harbour Tunnel. So uh, we're looking at that opportunity at the moment, but that is for operations and maintenance services uh, and, and nothing more. Okay, so we are considering stapling the operation and maintenance of the Harbour Tunnel to the operation and maintenance of the Western Harbour Tunnel. Is that I wouldn't characterise it as stapling it. Uh, I think that language is used uh, for other purposes. Well, concurrently um, offering them to the market. I, I would say we are going out to see whether it would make sense to bundle the O and M services for the Sydney Harbour Tunnel with the new Sydney uh, new, with the new Western Harbour Tunnel. Given they're in the same precinct, they're both uh, under Harbour Tunnels, and there would be some synergies, economies of scale, and sense in doing that. Sure. So just finally, before I pass that to my colleague, um, just on the question of the delivery authority and the corporate structure, my colleague put to you the state owned corporation option, but has transport um, created or is it considering creating a PTY LTD limited company to uh, contract with the, any party to do in any respect whatsoever with this project? I think I said earlier, we're very focused on dealing with the EOIs and getting the projects procured so we can get them yes, into I, That's why I'm asking, Ms. Drava, because I'm interested in who precisely is procuring. Is it the transport department? Is it a delivery authority you're establishing? Or is it going to be like the Sydney Motorways Corporation uh, for West Connex, a PTY LTD limited company? Uh, at the moment, it is transport uh, for New South Wales staff that are supported by a transaction entity. advisor. Which that, uh, legal entity is signing the contract on behalf of taxpayers that you are currently planning to procure for the construction? Well, the contract for the Winger Freeway Upgrade project, for example, is between Transport for New South Wales and the, the yes, general contractor. Uh, well, we haven't finished the procurement. In fact, we, we just barely started the procurement for the Western Harbour Tunnel, but that's that's the status so of I'll the moment. Just return to my first question then after that, um, which is, are you considering establishing a PTY LTD company that would be outside the state's freedom of information laws for the, any purpose whatsoever connected to the WHT? Uh, that's uh, not my understanding of our current approach. We, we are focused on procuring um, and having a contract between transport and the contractors. And that's the basis on which we've taken it to the market. Uh, that would be the expectation of the market at the moment. Mr. Graham. My, you've given us the timing for the uh, uh, Western get... Harbour Tunnel. I oh, might just finally ask you to give uh, the it is four thirty four thirty four thirty features oh. link as no. my final question. No, no. I'll notice. Um, once um, the government gives a investment no. decision, okay, okay. There was an agreement to do it until four thirty. It is four thirty. So yeah. I'm happy to withdraw that uh, question and I'll put it on notice. Okay, we'll no. put it on notice. Yeah. Um, we yeah. do thank the government for its vigilance with the clock. And um, <laughs> one thing I'm sure you guys can deliver on time. Um, can I- uh, well, Let's deliver anything, not like you guys. Uh, I thank the witnesses for spending the afternoon with us. Uh, it's most appreciated. Um, Ms. Drover and Mr. Paris, you did take some questions on notice for which you'll have 21 days to return an answer after you receive the transcript from the Secretariat. Um, you are now excused. Um, I will ask for members to just stay on uh, for our short deliberative. And then otherwise we'll uh, thank everybody who's been viewing and we'll bring the hearing to an end there, please.